I was with my niece, who's on her high school soccer team, and is taking it pretty seriously, and attempting to get some kind of scholarship out of it. I'm pretty healthy, and I don't really work out too much, but something I often do is run and hike. I live in Kentucky, not in a rural part, but there's a state park near my house that's 6,500 acres, so it's pretty secluded and densely wooded. There are some really nice trails that allow you to run for a good chunk and then hike for a bit to split up the long bits of the trail that are flat. She decided to tag along with me today for a quick three to four mile run. It was raining, but nothing too heavy. Kind of a spitting rain. Nothing we can't handle. We got up to the peak of this one hill, and it had been about two miles or so, according to our phones. So we decided to turn back and head back to the car. As we were headed down the steep side of the climb, we were walking pretty slowly, just to make sure we didn't slip and lose our footing. When out of nowhere, there was the coldest chill that came from behind us once we made it about halfway down. At the time it happened, we both commented on how cold it was, but we didn't make too much out of it and just went on with our conversation. In these woods, there are some wildlife, like small deer and maybe some coyotes, but they tend to stay away from the paths. At least I have only heard them in my many years of coming here. Never once have I seen anything more than a few tracks. Once we got off the hillside and hit a stretch of the trail that was flatter ground, we began to pick up the pace when a deer darted across the path, maybe ten yards in front of us, causing us to stop in our tracks. The first deer was then followed by three more, and not one of them even so much as looked in our direction. My niece looked at me, puzzled because of the oddity of it. To me, they acted like they were running from something, a predator of some kind. Once they'd gone, we started back with our run, and we heard a noise behind us, a loud, booming noise of something of substance falling to the ground from some height. When we stopped and turned, we saw nothing. No animals scurrying away like one would expect after a substantial noise in the wilderness. In fact, everything was eerily calm. Just as we looked at each other to ask what the actual hell that was, there was yet another cold wind gush through the valley, pushing all the rain off the leaves surrounding us, soaking our sweatshirts. Internally, I started to freak out, but I was doing my best to stay calm for my 17-year-old niece, but I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was freaked out. I tell her, come on, let's get to the car. And we turn to take off again. And there was a man, leaned up against a tree on the side of the trail dressed in a black suit with a white button-up shirt. His collar was open, but he had a tie on, sagging like a tired businessman on the way home from a long day. It startled me at first. I wasn't expecting to see anybody out there for a few reasons. One is that we were at the very least a mile away from any parking lot or street. Another being that we never heard or saw him coming. And the stretch of trail we were on was flat and open for a good half a mile. I got over to put myself between the man and my niece as we jogged past him. When we did, I looked him in the eye and gave him a how you doing nod as we went along. He was sort of pale. His eyes were very white but his irises were ice blue. Everything that I saw from the quick look I got up close looked to be clean cut and proper. I didn't notice a speck of mud anywhere on him, and the two of us had it caked on the bottom of our shoes and even on the backs of our pants and shirts from kicking it up as we ran. We had to get to the top of another hill, smaller than the last, but still quite the hike up. Once on top, I took a quick look behind us and he had seemed to vanish without a trace. Now with having the vantage point of the hill, I could see out past the trail and see most of the hill that she and I had just come from, and yet he was nowhere in sight. I scanned off the sides of the trail and still nothing. My niece asked me who that guy was and why he was out so deep in the woods wearing a suit, questions I simply didn't have the answers to. We made it back to the car with nothing else out of the ordinary happening to us on the trail. As we came to my car, I pulled the keys from my pocket and unlocked the doors from maybe 10 feet out. Walking up to the only car in the entire lot, 
I notice muddy footprints coming away from my car door from the driver's side. Weird, considering I had no mud on my shoes when we got there. But there are trails leading up to the lot, so I figured maybe somebody came through before we got there and I just never noticed. However, when I pulled the handle to open the door, the handle was caked with mud underneath, almost like somebody was attempting to open my door with a muddy hand. Nothing more happened, but the entire encounter leaves chills covering my body the more I think about it. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him, so we ran after him, and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost and started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. He asked if we were okay and if we were lost. I told him how we were chasing my cousin and we lost him and we didn't know how to get back home. He smiles and says, Don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch. Play with the children. And when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said, okay. So we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods in a clearing. But it had at least 60 people. We ate some stew or something like that, and he had me draw in the dirt the road and our house. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live, but if you want to play for a little bit, that's okay. I do want to get you home before dark, though. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats. Not good for children to be out. So he took us home. He never left the edge of the woods, my mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying that she was about to call the cops. Apparently we'd been missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin. And I said, we didn't. He was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind and we tried to call for him, but he was gone. That's when he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened, and she said, we'll figure it out tomorrow. The next day, we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me, and it looked like it had been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but got no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I've ever had. I don't know if he was a guardian angel or what, but I'm really glad I got to meet him. My husband and I really enjoy outdoor sports, especially camping. We sometimes go camping in forbidden zones, too. But we really do take care of the place we're staying, always cleaning up our mess and trying to leave it the way we found it. This happened during one of the times we were camping in a forbidden zone. We now call it the Fairy Forest. The forest is owned by a family that did a hell of a good job at decorating the place. 
Figures of fairies, elves, and angels were scattered around the brown fall leaves on branches and rocks. Dream catchers and other handmade artifacts, presumably made by children, were also hanging around the place. There were also little tables and chairs designed for the fairies, and info tables explaining about the fairies and elves. It was truly a fairy tale. There was one problem, though. Some douchebags threw things and broke some of the decorations. So we put them back up and mended what we could, and then we walked along. We set up our tent, cooked some food, enjoyed our drinks, and just chilled before going to bed. I woke up to three or four lights hovering over me at night. I wasn't scared, I was just surprised. I didn't want to open my eyes in case the lights disappeared. I wanted to prolong the experience as much as I could, but I soon drifted back to sleep. The morning sun penetrating our tent woke us up. As we were pouring our morning coffee, I casually told my husband that I saw lights hovering over us at night. He paused for a second and then said, I saw them too. We got into a heated discussion as to what they could have been. No, our overhead lamp could not have malfunctioned, because the lights were moving, almost swimming in the air, if you will. No, they could not have been people shining flashlights at us, because we didn't hear any footsteps, and the source of the lights were coming directly from our tent right above us. They were like balls of light, or orbs, not like rays. No, they couldn't have been airplane lights, or any other street lights, because again, the lights that we saw were moving. We believe that they were fairies, possibly thanking us for cleaning up the mess. We still go there from time to time, just to drink coffee, but we haven't camped there since. I always sense this amazing feeling each time I go there. That forest melts away my problems and gives me a content feeling, almost like it's telling me that everything's going to be okay and it's absolutely beautiful. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground, the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike there than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and ridden nearly every road. Every day I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had ridden out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. As the name suggests, they have live buffalo roaming and there's a large spring and fountain for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up, and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek and then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time and all I had to see by was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounding like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock, about the size of a baseball, rolling across the trail. Me being confused, I looked up the side of the hill. Just as I turn to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down, hitting my front wheel. I finally get my eyes to adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark and covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled that I had a cell phone and was gonna call the police. I didn't actually have one as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. For obvious reasons, I lit up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek I saw that it was a huge rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning, 
and told a ranger I knew there about what happened. He said, So you're telling me you were attacked by Bigfoot? He started snidely laughing. I said, Listen, I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. The ranger just laughed. Okay, Justin, if we have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and told me to get in. I asked him why, and he said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I owe you a huge apology. I'll be honest, I didn't believe you when you told me the story of how you were attacked, but it's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night, and they were attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, myself included. I immediately thought about what you told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud, had long hair and a large beard. Turns out he had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, in his mind, he thought he was back in Vietnam, and he was trying to, quote, take out the enemy. The park ranger said that I was very lucky, because while he wasn't Bigfoot, he was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statements as to what had happened. They had to send him somewhere to a more secure facility, and to this day, I still get shivers when I hike that trail, and I always keep my eyes on the ridgetop. I definitely feel bad for the guy, but that was also one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the backwoods. This is one of the most magical and unbelievable experiences I've ever had. A few years back, I went to an outdoor electronic music festival and was riding a natural high. No drugs, other than a little bit of pot, so a drug. The first night, at around midnight, the party is starting to amp up. I'm really into the music and I'm connecting with the DJ like there's no tomorrow. We're making almost constant eye contact and it's obvious he's aware of how deeply I'm appreciating the music. As the set goes on, we're connecting more and more. I know he can tell that I'm fully involved and giving my all to everything around me. Finally, he motions with his hand for me to turn around. I whip my head around to look behind me for one second. And when I turn it back, my jaw is dropped and I'm absolutely stunned. For the second that I looked back, I saw several brilliantly blue humanoid glowing beings walking intensely and purposefully through the forest. I just stood there in stupefied amazement, staring at the DJ with my mouth hanging open. As he looked back at me, he slowly and knowingly nodded his head. The beings looked exactly like the ones depicted in the movie Knowing. Note that I hadn't seen that movie yet when I experienced this though. They looked like humans without the hair but they glow with a brilliant blue, almost white light, and you can see through them. I told one of my friends about the experience, and he said that they're called the Devas, and that he is another friend who's seen them too. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking day trips. For context, I'm a 31-year-old female. I frequently visit the nearby provincial parks in Canada that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not at least seeing one or two people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips, 
and I feel very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when I'm expected to be back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir crazy. So I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. They're not long trails, but they are all interconnected, so it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't expecting to encounter many people, maybe a school group at most. I grab my backpack, lock the car, and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day, mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as you went along. I have been trying to teach myself how to identify different trees on site, so this path was the best. I made my way up the first little hill, and then I made my way down the path, where it takes a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any signs of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally, I'm comforted seeing somebody else on the trail, but this time my gut instinct was not happy. I made a note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path that I wanted to take to create a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled. So for once, I tried to be smart, listen to my gut, and just follow the main route back to my car. Keep it short and safe. There would be other days for a long hike. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided that they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger-like shadows that did not help calm my imagination at all. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders or rock formations right smack dab in the middle that you had to go around really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day. But today, they filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why, at first, until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rocks, going the wrong way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left, and these marks were to the right. It was like somebody walked around the rocks dragging their foot behind them. An animal? Maybe. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way that I'd come, but that would have added another four kilometers to get back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on the rock formation. As I made it to the other side of the rocks, I caught sight of some blue fabric, the same blue jacket that I saw earlier. The person moved as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For Blue Jacket Man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path through the woods or sprinted through about five to six kilometers of trails. I didn't like the thought of either option as I didn't know this person and at this point, I didn't want to know them. Maybe he was taking a leak. Yeah, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out. I texted my usual hiking friend, telling her all the details in case I went missing. Yes, I attempted to do this while following the path. I only walked into one tree. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight and I saw the man just standing there, looking at me. I ran the rest of the way back to my car, hopped in, and immediately locked the doors. Curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking area or on the road nearby. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Blue Jacket came from. I took a couple of minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trailhead. There was that damn Blue Jacket on the signpost I had just passed to get to my car, 
with nobody visible nearby. I was so spooked by this encounter that I refused to ever hike there alone again. Maybe it was all just an innocent misunderstanding, but it sure scared the hell out of me. So I live in Kentucky, in the city now, but we lived way out in the country when I was younger, in a very old, giant farmhouse. My family got it for cheap because it was falling apart, and the basement would flood and have a crawfish infestation because it was so old. The basement floor was basically dirt and mud. My dad and I would go on walks across the property to our neighbor's pond to fish, he allowed us free access to do this. This neighbor also owned a herd of cattle. One day, we were walking there, and at the top of a very tall tree, it had to have been 40 to 50 feet off the ground, there was a young calf simply impaled on one of the top branches. It had not been stormy for days, so it couldn't have been a freak tornado. It's worth noting that I was also abducted from this house twice. This was over 20 years ago, but I will never forget that moment. It is one of the things that's convinced me there's so much to this world we don't understand. This story is from when I lived off the grid in the forest of Western North Carolina. Some friends and I all lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft. They were very close together, so we all lived together in a community. Living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of deep, trusting friendship that you just can't get from living anywhere else. Naturally, we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track. If you followed it south, it would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall in particular is where everybody would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid, sometime in early July. A group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower or stop altogether in the group. So it was natural and expected that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form though, when Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her, and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. This pissed off both me and Laura, since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooky in the already creepy night. Laura and I eventually got to where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself, and then he slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing it as him just being affected, we kept moving forward. Still not back with the whole group yet, we realized that Andy had followed in behind us, just far enough away that we could only see his silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group, when he had last been seen at least 15 yards behind us just minutes ago. Everyone went dead silent, as Laura and I realized that whoever had scared her when she peed, and whoever had followed us after that, wasn't Andy or anyone else from the group. We never made it to the waterfall.
So this happened last year in Virginia, and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June. So I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area, just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and a swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and my parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them are really fun to talk to. As expected, I got further and further from the main trails, and I saw fewer and fewer people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds, no bugs, not even wind, and I had the distinct feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in, so naturally I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. That's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, so I went back and forth with it, and it would repeat whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. Like I would get goosebumps, and my hair would stand up on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make some dinner. As I did this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound, just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I wasn't safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was that a crafty animal had chewed through the rope and got the bag. But I looked at the rope and it was cut with something very sharp. Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bear footprints human footprints, all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from any road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. I saw nothing, but I heard that whistling again, my whistle from yesterday, but it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end, and this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. As I did, the whistling got closer and closer as I finally finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away properly. I just wanted to get out. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with it and finally I stood and yelled into the woods, shut up, what the hell do you want? It stopped whistling and it was quiet for a moment 
And then it repeated everything I had just said in my voice. It sounded just like me, but distorted, like it was coming from an old television. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I'd come from. I heard it moving, just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but never being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got farther and farther away from me, and then it suddenly stopped. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. I wish I never had, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech I've ever heard coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I just ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror on my face and asked if it was me that had screamed and asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down from where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail and as quickly as we could, all got the hell out of there. As soon as I got back in my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what had happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but that they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. As I was getting into my jeep, I hear the whistling coming from the woods just in front of me. Any help or advice on this is something that would be very welcome. My coworker and I are curious, and a little afraid to be honest, about why we've been seeing doppelgangers of all of our fellow coworkers. I've seen every single one of my fellow night shift coworkers when they shouldn't have been there and weren't there, except for one. In fact, she's the only person that neither of us have seen a duplicate of. Both of us have made eye contact with at least one of the copies. They're around all the time. It's almost a daily occurrence at this point, and we just don't know what to do, what they could be, why we're seeing them, and what they might mean. If you have any information, please let us know. A few years ago, when I was still married to my ex-wife, I saw my own doppelganger. My ex-wife was disrobing one night, and as soon as she got everything off and approached the bed, behind her was me, in shadow form, with a wide-eyed, surprised look, looking back at myself. Now, I've seen ghosts and UFOs, and I don't have any reservations about the paranormal, I'm usually inclined to believe the unexplainable, or at least have an open mind, but this one genuinely freaked me out. It was like me in the darkest tint brightness calibration before a video game. Was I scared? I mean, not enough to not continue with what we were doing that night, but I was pretty young and naive at the time. I've heard that it may mean death for the witness or something. Obviously that never happened, yet. But a rocky divorce and zero friends later, I can confirm a shitload of bad luck. Even got in an unwanted fistfight today. Attacked, even. Things are always happening to me ever since then. I guess I'm asking if anyone has any additional information on this. I can't find much, but closure would be nice. This happened a long time ago, 
I was 12 and in my grandparents' village. We had a cow and an ox. Usually the son of the bull, usually just one, took all the cattle to graze and at night he would take them back. Cows know where to go when they're going home. My grandpa had a male ox and since my father was an adult and he wasn't there, I took the responsibility. Basically, my job was to go around the village with the ox trailing after me, calling the people to open their doors. Our ox would grunt to call the herd, and all the females came out. From then on, I had to take them to a clearing up in the mountains, and then later take them to the river. It was easy. The animals already knew where they were going. They were calm, and our bull was a gentle giant. All I did was ride him, and I had a thin rope on his horns. If any of the females wandered off, all I had to do was call, or, on rare occasions, poke her with a dull stick in the right direction. My grandpa said that if I saw a wolf, a boar, or a fox, I should stay on the ox. Not many animals would dare go near an ox herd. There's a dark part of the forest where it's very quiet and even the bravest hunters won't go there. It's very slippery and dangerous. They said that even the deer and boar dare not go there. I was forbidden to go there and honestly, I never wanted to. It was an early morning and everything seemed fine. I was on the ox going up the mountain and I was glad that he let me because it was hard to trek up. I saw that one of the females was wandering off. I followed her and left our ox and the dogs to guide the herd. She went into the forest. I ran to her and got on tying the rope onto her horns. I tried steering her away, but she continued. She went into the dark part and stopped. I didn't want to get off in case she ran back and left me there. I heard a crunch and turned around. A very old man was walking toward us. He looked frail with dirty clothes and a long beard. I was scared, so I laid on the ox, clinging to her, not wanting to fall off if she ran. Oxen aren't like bulls. They don't jump and kick when they're scared. They either attack with their horns and trample or run. I was ready to hold on no matter what she chose to do. Our oxen don't take kindly to strangers. Before I took them out, I had to go to every house and have the ox owner introduce me to the animal. That way, they saw that their owner trusts me, and their herd leader, our ox, trusts me too. I knew that she would either attack or bolt, but she just stood there. The stranger came to us and petted her on the head, whispering something I didn't understand. He looked up at me, and his eyes were completely white. Then he turned around and left, just disappearing into the trees. Suddenly the female grunted as if she had just woken up or come out of a trance. Our male does that noise every morning, and then she bolted the way we'd come from. We found the herd. I quickly got on our ox and yelled water. He knew that command and went down toward the river. There were houses there, and it was closer than home. I barged in to one of the houses and tried to explain. The couple there stayed with me and sent their daughter to call my grandpa. I couldn't sleep for days, remembering those whited out eyes. My grandparents didn't let me out of the house or garden, and I wasn't allowed near trees. Later, I learned that they were protecting me from a lesnick a forest spirit which can take the form of a man, an owl, or a wolf. It hates when people go into his part of the woods and can kidnap you. I later learned that the ox which took me there had fallen ill and died. It sometimes stays in the trees as an owl looking for the offender. For years when I went to my grandparents, they wouldn't let me be alone. Not just outside, but inside too. All I know is that I'm never going into those woods again.
This happened in March of 2011, near my house in a small town, about an hour north of Indianapolis, Indiana. I was in eighth grade at the time, and it was during my spring break. That year, instead of sunshine and warm weather for spring break, there was a snowstorm, probably around eight inches or so of snow. My two friends, my two younger brothers and I, decided to make the best of it and just go play in the snow for the day. There was woods near my house, not a huge woods, but big enough to hike around in for a few hours. So we decided to do just that. About an hour into the hike, we stumbled upon what looked like an old well, a stone circle about 10 feet in diameter, about four feet high off the ground, and partially filled with foul-smelling, half-frozen water. We threw a few rocks into it and stuck long tree branches in to try to find out how deep it was. We tried with a branch that was at least 20 feet long, but we were never able to hit the bottom, so it was pretty deep. Now, the well by itself wasn't really creepy or anything, but how old it looked, and the way it was just stuck out in the middle of the woods, was a little unnerving. The part that really terrified us came about 20 minutes after discovering the well. We had decided that we were done messing around with it, and had just started to continue on into the woods, when we all heard something that made us freeze dead in our tracks with fear. Echoing through the woods came a loud, shrieking laugh. It was a high-pitched, grating voice that was still very loud despite seeming like it had come from somewhat far away. We all just froze for a moment, trying to make sense of what we'd just heard. The laugh came again, this time distinctly closer to us, but still not in our immediate vicinity. At that moment, none of us were saying a word. We bolted back the way we came, away from the sound, in the direction of my house. We didn't stop running for what seemed like forever, and we eventually made it back to my house without any more incidents. None of us had a clue as to what we had just heard, and none of us were ever brave enough to go back there and try to figure it out. I would love to hear any thoughts about what it could have been, paranormal or otherwise. I don't know if the part about the well was relevant or not, but it could have been, so I thought I would include it in my story. This is a very real story, and it's something that I personally experienced, and to this day I've never been able to explain it. So if you can, let me know. I was probably around 10 years old when this happened. My dad and I were driving down the road one afternoon in Columbus, Ohio. I remember looking out the window and seeing a large plane flying really low. If memory serves me right, it appeared really old and was maybe a military plane. We do have an Air Force base that's not far, so that would make sense. I remember being fascinated by the plane and excitedly pointing it out to my dad. He continued to drive while occasionally peeking over to look at it. After a few moments, the plane started to aggressively swerve like the pilot was losing control. Not long after, it nosedived and flew into a patch of nearby trees. I remember my dad panicking and pulling his truck over to the side of the road. We just sat there and looked out the window, but there was nothing. There was no sound of any kind, no smoke or fire, nothing. The trees didn't rustle and everything was calm. We waited, thinking the plane was going to swerve back up and fly away, but it never emerged. I remember asking him what happened and he was just silent. After a bit, he started driving again and we drove over to the area. We drove around for probably an hour trying to find some explanation, but there was nothing. Eventually, we headed back to my grandmother's place. We had dinner, 
and explained to her what had happened, but she probably just thought we were crazy. I remember us being eager to turn on the evening news to see if there was any mention of it, but nothing. Also nothing in the paper the next day. There was no real internet yet, so this was all we had. To this day, my dad and I still discuss this. The one thing we can't remember is if the plane was making any sound at all while it was flying in the air. Our radio might have been on or the windows up. We can't remember. But we know for certain that there was no sound from the supposed crash. It was only about a half mile away from us, so we would have heard something. It's like the plane literally vanished. This is the only experience I've ever had like this. I know it's a long shot, but has anyone ever experienced something like this? Do you have any idea what we saw? There's great comfort in knowing that my dad saw the same thing. Otherwise, I would have thought I imagined it. But we didn't imagine it. We saw it. And we still want answers. For about the last year, I've been seeing flashes of movement, pitch black shadows, in my peripheral vision. I've heard my name clearly called on three separate occasions by a deep male voice when I know I was home alone in the house. And I've started waking up covered in bruises and occasionally scratches. They're almost exclusively on my legs. The worst of it was the day I woke up with over 30 fresh bruises, some the size of softballs, many that look like random fingerprints. About three months ago, I visited a local metaphysical store and shared my experiences with them. Based on my experiences and the photo I gave them of my bruises, they did a remote cleansing and, on their advice, I did a sage and holy wood burning in my home buried black tourmaline at the four corners of my property and placed one over the door to my bedroom. Everything had been fine since then, but the bruises are coming back. And on Sunday, I saw a large black figure slip along the ceiling after my husband as he walked out of the room in a particularly bad mood. This thing was pitch black, like I said, and moving faster than my husband was walking. It was not at all possible that it was his shadow. I'm not exactly sure how he feels about the subject. On the one hand, he probably thinks I'm crazy. He asked what the black stone was all over the bedroom door. So I told him a truncated version of the truth about my visit to the metaphysical store. I left out hearing voices. He didn't say anything. On the other hand, he keeps saints in his truck for safe travel. He was raised Catholic, so I think he's open-minded to a certain degree. We have two cats and two dogs who have all seemed to react to the unseen disturbances as well. Cats will stare at the wall or the ceiling. I write it off to passing cars throwing reflections and so on. My older dog has started barking at a corner in the middle of the day. I chalked it up to him going senile. He is an 11-year-old St. Bernard mix. But the other night, I had just laid down to go to sleep and was trying to find a nature documentary on Netflix to put me out when I heard something in the guest room next door to my room fall. It sounded like a little picture frame or a decoration from the dresser. One of my dogs, who likes to sleep on that bed, ran into the master bedroom, jumped in bed with us, and was shaking like a leaf. I assumed it was kitty mischief, or that the dog had knocked something over, thus the shaking, and I would deal with it the next day. The only thing is, I checked first thing in the morning, and there was nothing out of place, and my husband said he hadn't put anything back either. I have a feeling this thing is targeting my husband. He is very stressed out at work. He works 50 plus hours per week at a job that, quote, destroys his soul, as he puts it. 
and another 20 plus hours per week trying to help keep our new business flourishing. He's very weak right now, emotionally and physically. He's very depressed about his day job and has chronic bronchitis, and I believe something nasty is trying to take advantage. I'd like to talk to him about it, but one, I'm afraid that admitting I know it's there will make it more powerful, and two, I'm afraid he'll think I'm nuts. But I know what I saw, and I know that I wasn't drinking or on any medications. I wasn't on drugs, and I'm not diagnosed with anything that would make me hallucinate. I know what I saw. Maybe I'm just stringing together random events here, but does this make sense to anyone? The following happened in a nearby woods when I was in 7th or 8th grade, which was the late 1980s, and to this day I have no idea what it was or why it happened. I'll preface this story by saying that, although I was fairly young when it took place, I had literally grown up in the middle of a forest and spent just about every free moment out among the trees. I never had any fear of nature, and by the time I was in middle school, I was already a pretty competent hunter and tracker, and could identify just about any animal by its tracks, sounds, or scat. I had had close-up encounters with groundhogs, raccoons, deer, and even coyotes and great horned owls, which is why whatever my friend and I encountered that day confuses me. I was at my friend Roger's house, also a burgeoning outdoorsman. One afternoon we decided to walk to a small woods maybe a quarter mile from his house, just to check it out. I think it must have been late fall or early spring, because the trees were barren, the ground was muddy, and it was chilly outside, around 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We weren't looking for anything, it was just something to do. So we walk over, enter the woods, and just start walking around, talking and looking at the trees and the occasional bits of trash that people had left behind. Eventually, we wander apart from each other by maybe 30 yards. There's not much overgrowth, so we can still see each other. It was about this time that I started getting that being watched feeling. A second later, out of the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of a white flash four or five feet off the ground. It seemed to come from or dodge behind one of the trees. It wasn't light exactly, but more like a very white object of undefinable shape and size. I looked around for a minute but never did see anything else and figured that it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. So I went back to exploring but then it happened again, and I still couldn't see anything when I looked around more directly. After a few seconds, the flash or white object seemed to appear and disappear among the trees in different directions. One time it would be off to my left, then, just a few seconds later, it would be to my right, or just behind me. I was a little freaked out, but mostly just really curious as to what was happening. This went on for maybe three to four minutes. Right about then, I noticed that Roger was standing next to me, looking pale and shaken up. I think we should go back now, he said. I have to admit I was a little disappointed, but I had never seen him look or act quite that way before. Usually, the kid wasn't afraid of anything, and was a little bit of a troublemaker. So, we trudged out of the woods, and back onto the little gravel road that ran to it, and headed back toward his house. Roger didn't say a word the whole way back. When we finally got back to his house, we went to get a snack, and as we were standing in the kitchen, I briefly asked him, So, out there... Did you see some kind of white thing? 
Because I kept... Almost immediately, he cut me off. Yeah, and I don't want to ever talk about it. Again, it was a response that was very out of character for my normally tough-talking friend. A couple of years later, he, I, and another friend would be on a late-night walk, get mistaken for burglars, and have a gun pulled on us. Even after being threatened with a firearm, he was never this quiet or freaked out. I dropped it, and I hadn't asked him about it since. I still see Roger occasionally, but we've never talked about that day again. And in decades of rambling around every sort of woods that I can find, I've never encountered anything like that again. Nothing has ever felt or looked like that. No bird, bear, mountain lion, or anything else. Not even people. I have no idea what we saw that day, but I hope somebody does, because it haunts me still today. Everything I'm about to tell you happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll just give you the facts of what happened, and you can draw your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm from Russia originally, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about the idea. As we're hiking, it starts pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest, until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All of this time, we're just talking about random things and getting to know each other while not really paying a lot of attention to our surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep in already, and it was pouring buckets like I said. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and I thought that was pretty cool. We kept going in that direction. Suddenly we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It's a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we didn't think anything of it and kept going. Within seconds, we heard the cry right next to us, which seemed so strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud that it couldn't have been more than a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking at the trees, but absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound started right up again, right next to us, like something was telling us to book it. So we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird, and we decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started popping up. It turns out the place was a site of ancient Native American burial grounds. I'm not surprised, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back, and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry, and that he wanted to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think this is a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him. For kicks, you know. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, I decided to go along, thinking that I could keep them out of trouble. Twenty-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, after all. So we hop in the car and we drive out there. The traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at about 11pm. We get out and head into the forest. Now, there are no streetlights anywhere near us, 
except right at the edge of the road. And flashlights can only do our visibility so much good, so it's pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actual deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We were not supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but there was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding on or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, started saying, there's nothing here. He kept mocking and then all of a sudden, he stopped. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic. One I've never felt before in a forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly we hear crunching coming toward us from out of the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking around and mocking seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. Nobody says a word until we get to the other side. Then Ryan says, I was just nervous because it, it might have been a homeless person and, y you know, I, I didn't want to deal with that. Sure. Eventually we get to the road where our car was parked. Alongside the road, I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looked to be either Native American or a mixture of Asian and Latina. She was walking along the highway, wearing very little clothing, and she looked off. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it. Vibrating? Undulating? I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of roads killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it, because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or not. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, with the creepiest slowest smile spreading across her lips and nodded. I was hit with that same feeling I got back there in the forest and I almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, screw it. My sense of wanting to help this girl was greater than whatever weird crap I was feeling. If I died, at least I would die with a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat, and next to Ryan. He's a womanizer and he starts to chatter up, asking where she's from and what she's doing out here all by herself. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's making consistent eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, slightly vibrating. I don't know, it just seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and without taking her eyes off me, she says, Oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except that there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home, and she gives Paul an address which is 15 minutes away by car, along nothing but forest. My eyes hurt from making eye contact with her, and she just kept smiling and undulating. This feeling of dread just kept increasing. So eventually we just dropped her off at her street. Lots of old-looking small houses. When I turned back to look just a second later, she was gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining that creepy smile. I imagined her creeping upstairs in the dark, her smiling face undulating from the shadows.
So this is something that I've kept to myself for two years now. And every time I think about it, the hair all over my body stands up. Here's some context. My girlfriend and I really like to try and find new hikes in western Colorado. We decided to try a new trail that was not on the National Monument and was a pretty far way away from any other trail. It was a good deal of the way out of town as well. Anyway, we were one of the only cars parked at the trailhead, and as we were walking, it quickly got dark. We made it all the way until the moon rose and I stopped to hug my girlfriend and have a romantic moment. All of a sudden, farther down the trail, at least a few miles, we hear automatic gunfire. It was just pop, pop, pop. Then silence for a couple of seconds. And then pop, pop, pop. Now, this kind of thing is normal for my area. Even though it was not public land, I knew a lot of buddies who would know of many forgotten trails to shoot on and not get caught at. My girlfriend asked me if I thought that those were gunshots, and I told her that I couldn't think of anything else it would be in the middle of the wilderness. We decided it would be best to turn back. We were about two miles down the trail at this point, at the top of a very large hill, covered in desert shrubs. As soon as we stopped talking, we realized that something was wrong. All of the insects had stopped chirping. There had been dozens of crickets the entire hike up, all of the sounds of nature completely stopped. My girlfriend was facing farther down the trail and I was facing back the way that we'd come, ready to turn back. She looks behind me and then screams and starts to run. I was already scared shitless, but I figured the worst it could be is some drunk redneck about to give us some trouble. I turned and looked where she was looking and then I immediately ran after her. I've never run so fast in my life. The shrubs were about two to three feet high in varying spots. And when I turned around, I don't know how to describe it, but it looked like a shadow. Even with the moonlight directly shining on it, it was almost an absence of light. It was already slowly standing up when I turned around. As soon as it fully rose up, I realized that I was looking up at it and this thing had to be at least a foot taller than me. I'm six foot three. It looked very much like skin and bones, but it wasn't human. We sprinted back to my car with nature silent the whole way. I was in such a hurry when we ran to my car and my girlfriend and I were both so scared that neither of us noticed I hadn't had to take out my keys to unlock the car. I didn't take them out until I was in the car. We were halfway through the drive home when we realized that every single hair on my body was raised. And if I'm being honest, I've never felt anything like I did when I saw that thing. Every fiber of my being screamed, run. And I was simultaneously almost paralyzed by the fear that washed over me. Does anybody have any idea what this could have been? I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. Keep in mind, the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town shut it down, and just lay down on the snow looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. Doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one particular night, without asking my parents, it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be introspective. 
It wasn't all that interesting a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring activity affecting the magnetic field and so on. And then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as the engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was that there must be an animal nearby, in which case I need to get out of there fast. You don't really want to be messing around with wild animals, especially in the Arctic. But the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding. And again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me, not laterally anyway. It was coming from above me. So naturally I look up, determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite crossing the sky. All normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I notice something strange in the Aurora Borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking that they were just oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved to be false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like someone started with tapping a pen on a desk to clacking billiard balls together inside my head. Then it stops. The lights are gone, the clicking isn't heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold, and rather petrified, so I jump back on the snowmobile, thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry, but soon it's running and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back, several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern lights behavior. Probably not that big of a deal, right? I pull up to my house. The lights are all dark. Strange. It wasn't that late when I left. I open the outer door as quietly as possible, remove my winter gear, and enter the inner door. The house is quiet. Really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anybody noticing. Proves to be easy, and I'm soon under my covers. I go to set my alarm for the next day. And all of a sudden, everything makes sense. The engine was hard to start. I was really stiff. It was rather chilly. Nobody up when I was gone what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11 p.m. when I left. And now, it was creeping up on 6 a.m. I stood, staring at clicking lights, for almost seven hours. I never ended up sleeping that night, and... I don't go on late snow machine rides anymore. Where I live, we've had relatively few cases during the pandemic. There were almost none back in the fall. Because of that, although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely, relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were unoccupied, and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings, quote unquote. Around 11 p.m., he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night and there were certainly no streetlights in the deeply wooded cabin area. 
So I grabbed my flashlight and we walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed that somebody was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his things, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, gradually moving away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling, coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby, and then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop, as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance, and then it would start all over. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door, and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things, while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure that somebody was on the porch, right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open, and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all of the windows and lowered all of the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself that it was just a bird or an animal only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that this wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 a.m., my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm gonna find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband's a pretty big guy, and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt, deep in my bones, that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I begged him and insisted that he go back to bed, and thankfully, he did. I sat vigil, listening to the intermittent whistles, for at least another hour, until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I woke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds, and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nighttime intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door.
This happened a while ago, somewhere near the end of seventh grade. My aunt, my brother, my cousin, and I were visiting our grandparents' house in Washington. They lived in a pretty remote area, with only a handful of other houses around, and a good chunk of forest between each of them. Keep in mind, it's also kind of an island, so they don't get many funky creatures there. My aunt and I went out while it was dark outside, just walking the path in the forest and trying to figure out what was making this loud noise. Not a weird one, just a normal forest sound. I said it was frogs. She said it was crickets. I was right. Anywho, we pass a pond area and make our way to a clearing. I'm not really sure if this is relevant, but the clearing was a little bit small, with an apple tree in the middle. That's where my brother and cousin and I would hang out whenever we were outside. When we reached the clearing, I started to immediately get this really bad feeling. I figured, you know, it's dark, I'm typically terrified of the dark, and I'm tired, but nothing's really going to happen. The path was a little bit overgrown around there, so we decided to turn back. Right before we did, though, I caught a glimpse of what could have been a really big owl up in one of the trees, just staring at us. Now, I'm an Arizona girl, so I don't know what creatures are normal in the forest, but this thing just didn't feel right to me. It just gave me a weird vibe. But my aunt kept walking and I caught up. Keep in mind, the path was pretty short, and it only takes about 10 minutes to get to the clearing and 10 minutes to walk back. But when we got closer to the house, we heard my grandma yelling for us. We run back to the house and she says that we've been gone for hours. We swear we'd only been gone for a half an hour at most. And when my brother and cousin come back, they tell us that they'd been out looking for us. We check the time and they're right. Another interesting thing that could be connected. A few days before that, we heard some really weird noises coming from the woods while we were out making s'mores. Even my grandparents, who have lived there longer than I've been alive, admitted that it was unlike anything they'd ever heard before. It continued getting closer and closer, and stopped any time somebody would try to get a video of it. Eventually, I had to go inside because all of this was freaking me out so badly. I guess it's not all that interesting, but it was really creepy. Everything else in the story could probably be explained, but the time loss thing really haunts me. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin, which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher, who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. This was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking about how we were the only ones on this road and we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was, which was a little unsettling. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to the moon. We had separate rooms in the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then my mother heard what sounded like footsteps and she saw what looked like the outline of a hat. There was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us are terrified that this man is going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered aloud if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed which was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep, but then we were awakened by an owl howling. My mother could see the owl's eyes, which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. 
That owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her, and its eyes really unnerved me. Neither one of us could sleep as every noise jarred us. It would be like, what's that? What noise is that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of the hat walking around the general area, and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out at this point, but we weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were in common use. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but as soon as the sun came up on Saturday, we left. We laugh about it now, but neither of us know what kept us up all night. It was a memorable night. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things I learned from scouts and the lessons it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, which was just a colored string of wool that they had to fix to the enemy base, a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were just leaders with flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everybody should return to camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided it would be funny to try to scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blackout silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making this growling noise. But then the silhouette simply turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face-planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front of me. I jogged a bit to catch up with them to make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone, and I didn't really tell anybody until years later, when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that that part of the woods had been cut down and the ground heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I've always wondered if the boy and the briefcase were connected.
This story takes place in North Italy, back in 2014. It was early September. A friend of mine suggested that we take a short hike in the woods near his town, and obviously I agreed, since I love hiking in nature. We prepared our backpacks, grabbed some food, and drove out to the place. My friend knew the area very well, so we didn't take a map. We didn't have any flashlights either, since we had planned to return to the car in just a few hours. And in early September, daylight lasts a pretty long time. As we got deeper into the woods, we saw a lot of beautiful things. Rivers, a pair of caves that we explored. We had lunch and proceeded to follow a trail into a deeply wooded area. After around a half an hour, at that point we were about 50 minutes away from the car, we arrived to a pretty large clearing. In that clearing, there were four to five people, normally dressed. They were simply talking and laughing. No satanic cults or dreadful chants or praying in circles or anything like that. Just super ordinary people, like my friend and I, talking to each other. They obviously saw us too, since the clearing had no trees or rocks to cover the views and we couldn't avoid that. As we approached them, we just said, Hey there, what's up? They didn't answer back, and they just started to stare at us, without saying a single word. Obviously, this was a huge red flag. We stopped, too, and I looked over to my friend. He looked back at me, concerned. We again said, Hey! No answers. I've started to feel uneasy, so we decided to return back to the car. Soon after we moved back, though, we realized that they started to follow us. As we noticed that, we yelled, Hey, why are you following us? Did we do something wrong? Yeah, we were pretty young and dumb. In those kinds of situations, it's often the best thing to just run immediately out of there, but we thought we would try to be nice. No answer. Obviously, we proceeded to walk faster, and we tried to go off the trail. Another pretty dumb choice. But again, my friend knew the area well. But no matter what we did, they were always around, at about 15 meters distance. We started to panic, so we looked to each other again and agreed to get out of there as quickly as possible. As soon as we started running, we could hear behind us that they began running too. This obviously made us freak out even more. We did our best to put distance between us and them. Another thing that made me panic was, like I said, we were about 50 minutes away from the car. We were in a very isolated area, so I thought our situation was hopeless. At a certain point, when we were about halfway back, we started to notice that they weren't behind us anymore. We thought that maybe, and luckily, we had managed to lose them. The area, like I said, is pretty heavily wooded and has plenty of slopes, so it's easy to get lost if you're not used to it. Plus, we took an off-trailway that my friend knew. We hid behind a thick bush and tried to listen. Silence. No footsteps. No voices. Although, even when they were following us, they didn't say a single word. So, we took our breath and managed to return to the car, trying our best to be as silent as possible. We jumped in the car and raced the hell out of there. But it doesn't end there. As we left the woods on the main road, we saw coming from a secondary road another car behind us. They were following us again, and they surely never lost our tracks while we were returning to the car. We're very sure that they were the same people, because one, they were basically tailgating us. Two, the area is very rarely visited, and there were absolutely no cars in the parking lot except for my friends. And three, their car had no plates. We drove to my friend's town, avoiding going to his house, taking every country road, and every turn we made, they did as well. As we reached the town's ingress, they made a U-turn and returned back to the woods direction. We were fucking terrified, and we immediately called the police and informed the people that were in the small town square as they approached us. My friend and I were basically crying as we got out of the car. We checked the area out, but... No evidence of activity came up in the following hours. They never showed up anymore in the following days, but we became paranoid for some weeks to even get out of our houses. This is why I took a break from hiking for about four years. 
I have no idea who they were and why they acted like this, but that experience nearly gave me PTSD. It's been completely terrifying, and it still affects me to this day. My mother and father divorced when I was eight. I lived with my father until late 1995. I was 13 when I moved in with my mother. But in 2002, I had a falling out with my stepfather and ended up moving in with my father. My father lived in the country while my mother lived in a small town. My father's home was surrounded by a forest with few neighbors situated on a hill. When I was a child, I used to walk through the woods so I knew them really well. In 2004, my father's home burned to the ground, and we left the area, moving into a small town and living in an apartment. I ended up in college studying film, and I was tasked with making a film, of course. I decided to shoot a short film about a serial killer stalking campers in the woods, because apparently I was really unoriginal at the time. So, me and my two friends, Adam and Zach, were looking for locations. I figured the forest where I used to live would be perfect because it was in the middle of nowhere and there would be no sounds. So, we did what you normally do, scout locations. One for the campsite and routes that the protagonist and antagonist would take through the forest. We arrived and were deep in the woods, as this time only one person still lived in the area and he wasn't home nor did he own all the land, so we stayed well clear of his land. As we were moving through the forest, trying to find the perfect clearing, all was quiet, which was startling, because though we were deep in the woods, the sounds of birds and bugs were kind of a normal thing. It was in the afternoon, so there really wasn't any reason for the forest to be silent. We came across a clearing that I knew well, but it was different. When I was a child, deep in the forest there was an old wooden structure. It was flat, and we called it the stage, because that's what it looked like. It was in a clearing, right next to a tree line with a wide field that could fit hundreds of people there for a concert. Whether that's what it was, or it was something as simple as the floor of an old shack, I don't know. All I know was when I had gotten there, there was a camper, and someone built a pond right in the middle of the clearing. We decided that clearly somebody was using the space, so it would be best to find a different spot. We went to the tree line and descended down a steep hill to a creek. All the while, talking to ourselves about how weird the silence was. If you live in or around a forest, you hear wildlife all the time. The lack of it in such a dense area was strange. We crossed the creek and made our way through fallen trees and large rocks until we found ourselves in a very wooded area. Adam had noticed first and pointed to a grouping of trees that made a perfect circle. Under the dead leaves lay stones, arranged in a circle, and in the center was broken bottles. I walked over to it and ended up tripping. I braced myself with my forearm and deeply cut it on a broken bottle. As I stood up, the silence was broken by a loud scream. It sounded human, female, but it was a scream. I turned to where I thought it came from, and beyond the trees, in the brush, I saw something red run off. We decided to head back. As we came back to the stage and pond area, a truck pulled up. The guy that was the only person living in the area ordered us into his truck to take us out of the area. He said that he owned all that area and that we were trespassing. He knew me, so he didn't give me a hard time or threaten me. He dropped us off, and I asked him how he had known we were there. I didn't, he said. I just heard some scream and thought some idiot fell in the pond. I ended up with stitches in my arm after going to the ER. I only have two plausible explanations for that scream. First is that we didn't know what was beyond the brush. It could have been a home, and maybe kids were playing. While the scream was loud and I saw something bright red running, we could have startled someone. But the problem with that theory is that the guy who came in the truck heard it too. And we were far enough away from where he lived 
to where he would have a hard time hearing it. The only other one is that the scream had come from behind us, and because of the trees, sound echoing made me think it was in front of us. This might account for how the guy had heard it too. His home is halfway to the stage area, which is why he was able to get there so fast. But that doesn't account for the red thing I saw, or what the scream was in the first place. And no, I don't think it was a fox or anything like that. I've spent enough time in the woods to know what those sound like. And the red that I saw wasn't like that of a fox. It was bright red, like dyed fabric. I still am completely unable to explain this. My stepdad and I are pretty cool. He's been in the family for about two years now, and he's told me a few stories that I'll always remember. This is one of them. He's a hunter, and he's always hunted with his family and friends from church. One weekend, he and some guys from church were hunting rabbits using dogs. While they were in the woods, they passed an abandoned barn, probably because there was a farm not far away. They kept going through some thick brush until it opened up to a less thick forest. In the trees, there were what seemed to be squirrel nests, but these were different. They were big enough for a person to lie down in. When they got here, the hunting dogs started barking and ran to the trees that held the nests, as if there was some kind of animal up there. My stepdad and the other men grabbed the dogs and kept walking because they figured it was just raccoons, and they were only after rabbits. They kept combing the woods, and the dogs jumped one rabbit, which one of the men shot. After he shot it, however, one of the shells failed to eject, so he went back to the truck to fix the gun. As the rest were hunting, they heard a shot coming from the direction of the truck. They walked back, thinking that he had shot another rabbit. When they started on their way back to the truck, they met the man walking through the woods to meet them. He told them that he had fixed his gun and sat down to eat some crackers that he had bought at a gas station before the hunt. As he was eating, the shotgun went off, even though it was just a couple of feet away, laying on the bed of the truck. He also added that he clearly remembered the gun being on safety. After that incident, they quit the hunt. Before they left, one man brought up that he felt weird the whole time they were hunting, as if somebody was watching them. The others said that they felt the same way, especially after they encountered the nests in the trees. My stepdad told me about where it was they were hunting, and I've been by there before. What I can see from the road is thick, thick forest that's almost in the middle of nowhere, with that one farm and a cotton field. It makes me scared to go hunting by myself. I didn't realize this before yesterday, but I might have experienced something paranormal on a camping trip. I realized it because I was reading a story online about a hunter that heard the voice of his brother in the woods. As I scrolled through the comments, I became familiar with some cultural stories about creatures that can lure us basically to our death. Well, last year, we went camping with some friends. It was early September, but still hot enough to sleep outside. We made ourselves a lovely camping spot with a big bonfire and some candles around it. I have some psychic abilities and can feel if a spirit is near or something. Usually I can sense if it's a female or masculine or if it's a child presence. Sometimes I thought I could feel something, but I didn't want to think too much about it. I didn't want to get scared and fall into paranoia. The evening went fine and we stayed up until about 1 to 2 in the morning before going to bed. I woke an hour or two later in full mode panic attack. I have a history with anxiety, but I've never felt that kind of nausea before. 
It was like everything that I experienced before when I had my moments of high anxiety, but multiplied. I was sleeping with my boyfriend in the tent, and he asked if I was okay. I told him that I was feeling very bad and probably having a little panic attack, which had never happened to me before in that setting. I assumed it was just because we were laying on the ground and it wasn't very comfortable, and maybe I had gotten uneasy during my sleep. So I sat up and started doing some breathing exercises to calm me down. It didn't really work, and I ended up having to leave the tent to throw up. After that, it kind of got better, and I was eventually able to fall back asleep a while later. The next morning, we all woke up and started packing up our stuff. I told the others about my story, and my boyfriend and one of his friends started talking about how they heard footsteps around our camp during the night. I didn't think much of it, since I didn't hear it, but according to my boyfriend, it happened just before I woke up, and that's why he asked me if I was okay because he was already awake, listening to the footsteps when I woke up panicking. Fast forward to today, I never really thought about this incident much. I thought it was just an episode of panic that was brought on by the fact that I pushed my body a little too hard that day when we went on a long hike. But now that I've read all these stories about all of these creatures, and I remembered that I sensed something early on, and given that my boyfriend and his friends heard footsteps, I wonder if I woke up that night feeling the intense danger that was around us. I went to Moonville when I was in college in Nelsonville. We decided at around 10 p.m. Let's go search for this supposedly haunted tunnel. We arrived at about 10.45 p.m. Unaware of the parking lot and the bridge that led right to it, we parked a few miles down the road from it, on an old railroad track that's now a path. Our friend promised that he knew the way from there. We followed the walking path that just stops at a very steep embankment, almost 90 degrees. We all climb down and then come to Raccoon Creek and cross a shallow part. We wander around for a bit, roughly until midnight, trying to find this tunnel and anything particularly paranormal or out of the ordinary. All of a sudden, we're in this canyon type thing and everything in the middle of it is dead. Trees, birds, insects, nothing was living and there were animal corpses that covered the canyon floor. One end of the cliff was about 35 feet down, so I'm not sure what was there. When we found our way out of the canyon, it was like we had just exited a completely different world. Everything was living again and you could hear birds. Thinking to ourselves that we thought we had only spent about 30 minutes in there, we checked our phones. Our phones were doubling as our flashlights and all of them were almost dead. It was three o'clock in the morning. Knowing that this was the witching hour, we all started to freak out a bit, and knowing that there were cults and sacrificial rituals that were performed in those woods often, we wanted to get out of there. We didn't know where we were, and we were trying to use our maps on our phones, but we didn't have any service, so that wasn't a lot of help. And then, our phones started to die, one by one until we got to the last bit of battery on the last phone. That was when we found the one-lane gravel road and instantly were able to run out and find our vehicles and get the hell out of there. Since then, I've only been back once and it was in the daytime after finding out about the bridge to it. Definitely one of the creepier experience I've ever had and I haven't ventured back to that spot from the first night and I don't plan to again. Another interesting note is that it's said that a goat man lives on top of the tunnel, although I've never had any encounter to prove this, but I thought maybe it was worth a mention.
This was back in June of 2016. My mom and dad had taken a trip out west. They had entered Muir Woods and were not very far in, no more than half a mile. Of course, they're both admiring the huge trees, taking it all in, snapping photos and basking in the general magnificence of the towering woods. So my mom says that both she and my dad are standing in front of this one huge tree. There are tourists bopping around close by, feet away. As she's looking, she notices this movement coming from the bark. I ask her how high up, and she says it was at approximately eye level, so four and a half to five feet. My mom is short, five foot nothing. She said all of this happened in the span of about five seconds, movement in the bark directly in front of her, and then she sees it take the shape of a face. First the brows, then a nose, eyes, lips, and chin. She says the face is protruding out of the trunk. I ask how big this face is, and she says almost a foot tall from chin to forehead. As the face is continuing to bulge, she lets out a small, involuntary gasp. And just like that, as if the face realized it was being noticed, it shrunk back into the bark, and the tree returned to normal. Not looking away from the tree, my mom says, Kelly, did you see? And my father completes her sentence with, the face in the tree, yes. Not a question, it was a statement. Another woman who was a couple of feet away stepped up to where my parents were standing and said, I saw it too, and then moved away. Now, either the majority of the group was already moving out, or my father just began walking away on his own accord, but they both leave the tree. Mom said she started asking my dad about what he saw to see if it matched what she did. He said he wasn't comfortable discussing it right then and told her to hush, that if people heard them, they would think they were crazy. So, they leave it alone. But later during the trip, he still doesn't want to discuss it. Now, even though my dad has had his fair share of wild experiences, and he will usually humor bizarre conversation, he's handled this whole situation like a total Hank Hill. Maybe since he can't fully understand it, he rebukes it. I don't know. He's always been particularly sensitive on the topic of the paranormal. He almost rejects it, but I know he believes in it enough that he's afraid of giving it power by acknowledging it. Like he knows giving it a thought is the same thing as giving it energy and room to grow. I feel like I know this because I bought my mom dousing rods once. She didn't think I could find them. This was 10 years ago when she didn't understand the vastness of Amazon shopping capabilities. I took it as both a challenge and a Christmas gag gift. My dad went into town and the rest of the family started playing with the rods, asking it questions. My dad walked in the door, saw the rods, and said, I don't want those in this house. He was pissed. He equated them to a Ouija board, which was absolutely off limits in our house. To this day, my mom has so many questions. What did she see in that tree? What would it have done if it hadn't been seen? Was it an entity from another plane? Has this phenomenon ever been mentioned in Muir Woods? I don't know, but it certainly was an interesting experience to hear about. My husband and I really enjoy outdoor sports, especially camping. We sometimes go camping in forbidden zones too, but we really do take care of the place that we're staying, cleaning up our mess and such. This was one of those times when we went camping in a forbidden zone that we now call the Fairy Forest. This forest is owned by a family that did a hell of a good job at decorating the place. Figures of fairies, elves, and angels were scattered around the brown fall leaves, on branches and rocks. Dream catchers and other small handmade artifacts, presumably made by children, were also hanging around the place. There were also little tables and chairs designed for the fairies, 
and info tables explaining about the fairies and elves. It was truly a fairy tale. There was one problem, though. Some douchebags threw things and broke some of the decorations. So we put them back up and mended what we could, and then we walked along. We then set up our tent, cooked some food, enjoyed our drinks, and just chilled before going to bed. I woke up to three or four lights hovering over me at night. I wasn't scared. I was just surprised. I didn't want to open my eyes. I felt like if I did, they would disappear. I wanted to prolong the experience as much as I could, but soon I drifted back to sleep. The morning sun penetrating through our tent woke us up. As we poured our morning coffee, I casually told my husband that I perceived lights hovering over us at night. He paused for a second and said, I saw them too. We got into a heated discussion as to what they could be. No, our overhead lamp could not have malfunctioned because the lights were moving, almost swimming in the air, if you will. No, they could not have been people shining flashlights at us. We didn't hear any footsteps, and the source of the lights was directly above our tent, like right above us. They were like balls of light or orbs, and not like rays. No, they could not have been airplane lights or any other street light, because again, the lights we saw were moving. We believe that they were fairies, possibly thanking us for cleaning up the mess. We still go there from time to time just to drink coffee, but we haven't camped there since. I sense this amazing feeling each time I go there. The forest melts away my problems and gives me a content feeling, almost like it's telling me that everything is going to be okay. It was Labor Day of 2015. My mother, my wife, and my three children and I went to a very remote cabin that we rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort, so it had the cabin and three other sheds and shops. I'll try to keep this short now, but it's a bizarre story. We unpacked, settled into the cabin, and then decided to walk a couple hundred yards down to the river, barefoot and sandals with shorts for all of us. We got down to the pebbled shore and were playing and throwing rocks, etc. When I realized that there were one foot long snakes everywhere, my wife, my mom and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance from them, I went back with a water bottle and caught one in it to see what it was. Turns out we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of those things had latched onto one of my kids, they surely would have died. We were about three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin and my mom and I went for a hike and a walk alone, while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning about 15 minutes later, all three of my kids and my wife were inside with the doors and windows all closed up, even though we had had everything open to cool the place off. We went inside to hear all four of them yelling about a bear that was about 150 yards from the cabin huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch and eating. It was down by the river, another 30 yards or so down the hill, that he poked his head up and over from. A few hours go by, and in that amount of time, an ATV passes by three times, with two inbred-looking freaks on it. Each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us, or the cabin. Keep in mind that we're two hours into the wilderness in Idaho, with no sight of a person the entire trip except for them. We decide it's bedtime for the kiddos as it's pitch blackout. Within 10 minutes, our son, who was five at the time, went from being perfectly fine and active and talkative to having a fever of 103 degrees, slightly foaming at the mouth, and then being completely unresponsive. That was it. We were leaving immediately and going to seek medical attention. I opened the front door to the cabin to start loading the two cars by the light of one porch bulb and the headlights on the cars, which were both parked facing the gate. And that's when all three of us adults heard about four to six large and heavy animals running all around the cabin and the property. 
There was one on the right side of the house when exiting that I could hear pacing back and forth and breathing heavily. I made everybody stay inside and close the doors every time I went out to transfer stuff to the cars, about four or five trips of this. I had a stick and a big pot that I was smacking as hard and as loudly as I could on each trip, and I was yelling loudly at random. As soon as I'm done loading, I take each kit out individually and load them up between the two cars. Then I escort my mom and my wife out. My wife and I were in the lead car, so we pulled up out of the gate, and for some stupid reason or another, I felt that I needed to close the gate. So I got out of my vehicle and walked behind it in my mom's car about 15 feet, and I closed the gate. Now, this gate was literally a log that slid from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and whatever was out there. Right as I went to turn around, I heard loud padded footsteps walking up to me, directly in front of me, no more than 10 feet. And then, I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I've ever heard in my life emanated. I turned and ran so fast that I swear I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat. I landed in the seat and slammed it into drive and spun out, finally leaving. But it gets weirder and scarier. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son, and we both kept having this horrible, evil doom feeling, like a shadow was cast over us. I looked down, and I realized that I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder. So I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we hear our son softly crying. We realize he's responsive, and he stated something along the lines of, Why are we leaving? What's going on? He was crying because he didn't want to leave. He couldn't remember the last hour or so. Quick backstory for what's next. My mother was about 58 years old at the time. She's been a Jehovah's Witness my entire life, plus many more years before that. And she's the last person in the world to believe in signs or evil spirits or omens or anything of the sort. The next day, my mom completely broke down, sobbing her eyes out, hardly able to talk. She confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on the camping trip. We came across snakes, a bear, and a pack of wolves. She said she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost and that it was full of evil. Most of all, she said, In my dream, one of your kids died. I swear on my life to this very day, if I ask her who died and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuses to tell me or anyone. She lives her whole life now with the guilt that she willingly ignored this nightmare and feels like she put us into that danger, nearly taking one of her grandkids away from the world. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know this sounds crazy as hell, but a week later, on the local news, there were reports of a wolf pack in the area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony, but as far as I know, they do share territories and respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was about an hour and a half into the wilderness from Loman, Banks, Idaho area. If you want to verify the animals actually exist around there, go for it. Sadly, I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre- and early teen years, as did my wife until she was 10 years old. I even have a half-sleeve of the wilderness and trees on my left arm, but with that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. I don't care if you believe me or not. This was and is real to my family, and it did happen to us. That night changed a lot of things going forward. The other night, around 9.30 at night, I was playing Smash Ultimate in my living room, minding my own business while I was watching horror videos. It was nothing special, a fairly normal occurrence. Then suddenly, as the narrator finished a story about a skinwalker, I felt it. The most extreme feeling of being watched I have ever felt. I could pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. The window 
to my right. My window has blinds, but they suck, and they're easy enough to see through if you get close to the window. Personally, I believe in the paranormal, and I do believe my house is haunted. But the ghosts in my house have only ever been pranksters who are rather kind-hearted. As a note, I also live in Arizona, not too far from a Native American reservation. Anyway, this feeling was intensely strong and struck an immediate response in my brain, which is typically pragmatic and relatively fearless. I paused the game, turned off the switch, and went straight into my room, closing the doors behind me, turning off the videos, and instead turning on Critical Role. Yet the feeling stayed, as if whatever was watching me could see through my doors. I had enough, so I grabbed my machete, it was a gift from my grandpa that I use while camping, and unsheathed it, then walked straight to the window, peering through it. There was nothing, nothing but my neighbor's house, but the feeling hadn't subsided. I decided to take a more supernatural approach. I found the sage in the kitchen, grabbed a lighter, and began to burn it, spreading the smoke around my house until it felt like the feeling had passed. Then I grabbed some clothes and took the bowl into the bathroom with me and showered. The feeling was completely gone, as if the sage had repelled whatever was watching me. It was certainly freaky. I'm not sure if it was a skinwalker or not, or if my body just picked up on someone watching me who left when they saw my weapon. But whatever it was, it was strange. This is a collection of my experiences revolving around the Blue Ridge Parkway. From the summer of 2002 until early 2004, I lived in a small town outside of Asheville, North Carolina. There wasn't much to do in the area on a Friday or Saturday night, other than hang out with friends at the movies, go to the bar or pool hall, or, in our case, the scenic overlooks on the Blue Ridge Parkway. My group of friends go to meeting spot was one of the two overlooks off of the Blue Ridge Parkway. We would jump on the parkway off of the Tunnel Road, US 70, and drive about three miles north to the Hawk Creek Overlook, park our cars, and depending on the weather, sit outside and just talk the night away. It may sound boring, but those nights were some of the best of my life, filled with laughter and pure joy. It's where we went to decompress from our early 20s stress-filled days. We would usually meet up there any time between 9 to 11 p.m. and not depart until well past 2 a.m., often ending our nights at the nearby Waffle House. Depending on the time of year, the Overlook would get busy with other groups of friends doing the same as us. Romantic dates, nature enthusiasts either camping out in their cars or returning from or embarking on hikes. On certain occasions, Hawk Creek Overlook would be too crowded for our liking, so we would just proceed to the next overlook, which was Tanbark Ridge. That was almost always nearly empty. It was in these areas that my friends and I experienced truly paranormal and possibly demonic experiences. On most nights, they would come and go without any of the normal events to speak about. That slowly changed. On certain nights, there could be as many as six of us hanging out on the Overlook, other nights only two. On one particular night, and the first Blue Ridge Parkway experience that I can recall, we were standing and talking near the back of my car while we smoked a cigarette, facing the road, the parkway. We were the only car at the second Overlook, Tanbark. When we weren't talking with each other, it would get quieter than quiet up there. The whole night we kept hearing what sounded like conversations or voices coming from the side of the mountain across from where we gathered. It wasn't uncommon for there to be night hikers or campers in the area, but these voices were not coming from an area that was known for trails or camping. As we were standing near the back of my car, we all heard the voices, louder than before this time. At first it was from our left, 
then immediately from our right, and then finally straight in front of us. The voices, although rather loud, were unintelligible. We couldn't make out what they were saying. It was almost like gibberish or some kind of made-up language. We were all expecting to see someone by how close in proximity the voices were, but there was nobody around us. No car had even passed the overlook for a while. We wrote it off as having to be hikers conversing somewhere on the mountain, and their voices somehow carrying or being projected through the woods in some weird acoustical thing. For weeks after, we told the story to our other friends and co-workers, who would all share similar accounts with us. That was the start of many more strange and sinister occurrences. Simultaneously with the strange events that I experienced on the Blue Ridge Parkway, my family and I were also experiencing paranormal activity at the house we were renting in Swannanoa. I wondered at the time if the occurrences were related in any way, which as time went on and more events happened, I don't think they were connected at all. The night that I believe triggered a string of events was a Saturday after work. Before heading to the first overlook, I stopped and picked up my friend, and we proceeded to get on the Blue Ridge Parkway. About halfway up from the entrance to the Blue Ridge Parkway and on the first overlook, we noticed a pickup truck three quarters of the way into the woods, off of the road, with only its interior dome light on, and a man returning to the truck with a shovel in his hand. My friend and I instantly got creeped out by this peculiar sight, and half-jokingly both said that the guy was probably hiding a body. Later that night, when we were leaving the Blue Ridge Parkway, I drove past that exact spot where we had seen the truck and the man earlier. I nearly drove off the road, as my dome light in my car turned on and nearly blinded me. It's dark on the Blue Ridge Parkway, no lights at all. Almost gave me a heart attack. The light was on for maybe a second or two, and then it shut off. I'm generally a level-headed and rational person, but at that moment, I was shook. My friend was equally in shock, and we both calmed ourselves down. When we got to his house, we sat in his driveway and tried to make sense of it. That light only turns on if you open a door. We did not open a door. That light had never once turned on for any other reason before that. After I dropped off my friend, I had to drive under the Blue Ridge Parkway bridge on my way back home. As I passed under the bridge, my light again turned on. But this time, it flickered a few times and then stayed off. In my opinion, this was now past the point of coincidence. That was not the last time that my light went off in my truck, for a span of a few months. Not every time, but almost the light would come on or flicker near that spot on the Blue Ridge Parkway where we saw the man and his truck. One of my friends who was driving behind me one night saw the light go off from her car and it scared her so badly that she did not return to the Blue Ridge Parkway at night anymore. On one night, three of us gathered at the first overlook. It had rained a lot the day before and that morning. On the opposite side of the overlook, there was a sheer rock wall that ascended about a hundred feet. There was enough moonlight to see the water trickling down the rock wall. It was my friend that was riding with me when we saw the man that noticed that the water coming down the rock wall appeared to resemble a person's head, tilted sideways. I agreed, and so did our other friend. But as more water ran down, it looked like it formed a rope around the person's neck. And as time went on, more water rolled down, and the person resembled a girl. It was almost too clear, like somebody was purposefully creating this effect. We started to concoct ideas that perhaps that man did do something bad in those woods, and maybe the light flickering and the water on the rocks was a calling of sorts. I had disabled the light in my truck from going off. It still went off a handful of times after that, which should have been impossible. But the cherry on top of it all was on the night that I was the last one of my friends to leave the Overlook. As I drove down to leave the Blue Ridge Parkway, again near that spot, my front driver's side tire blew out. I pulled over on the shoulder of the road and tried to call one of my friends, but I didn't have cell reception. If it wasn't that I had to be at work in the morning, I probably would have just slept in my car until there was light, but that was not an option. 
I proceeded to get out and change my tire in the pitch black night. I felt so vulnerable, and although nothing happened, I felt as if I wasn't alone. I felt that at any moment, something, I don't know what, would occur to scare the living shit out of me. But nothing did. Until I got back in my car and started pulling back onto the road. At that moment, my light again flickered, and I swear I instantly felt my right side of my body get about 30 degrees colder. The next day, my friend and I called in anonymously to the Asheville PD and reported what we had seen in the woods, the truck and the man. Obviously, we did not mention any of the paranormal events that had occurred after that. We felt as if we had to say something, but for the longest time we weren't sure what or how to. We hadn't heard of any disappearances or murders in the area. But then again, in my early 20s, I wasn't an avid reader of the paper or watcher of the local news. These events all happened around spring to late fall. We stuck to the bars and pool halls for months after those events, until early the following year. We finally decided to venture back to the Blue Ridge Parkway more frequently. My friend and I, the same friend, were starting a new band, and the Blue Ridge Parkway was a great place to collaborate and write songs. One night, and my last night ever spent on the Blue Ridge Parkway, we took up an acoustic guitar to help finish writing a song. That night, both overlooks were crowded, so we drove to this little cut right off the road, just past the first overlook. We settled there and propped open the tailgate of my GMC Jimmy. We were up there for a couple of hours, probably around one to two in the morning at this point, when we start hearing straight up laughing coming from the woods and the tree line close to the car. We stopped what we were doing and just froze and listened. The laughing stopped and we heard what sounded like a horse snarl followed by a whisper. We heard a laugh again and finally, we hear somebody go, psst. We immediately closed my tailgate, jumped in the car, and drove down to the first overlook. At this point, it had cleared out, and there were no other cars there. I pulled into the overlook with my car still facing the road, not pulled into a parking spot. We had no idea what those sounds that we had just heard were or what they'd come from. It just didn't make any sense. At the overlook, my friend got out of the car to relieve himself. We both lit a cigarette and decided to head back to the car as it started to rain a little bit. Just before we got back, we heard what sounded like a gallop or horse hooves getting louder from the area we'd just left. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I had an overwhelming feeling to just get the fuck out of there, and so did my friend. Without saying anything to each other, we ran and jumped into my car to leave. As I turned over the key and started the car, I happened to look back, and that's when I saw an image that to this day I will never forget. I saw what looked like a tall, goat-like man. I distinctly saw horns as it began to run full speed toward the car. I didn't look back again, and I drove like a bat out of hell from that area. My friend didn't look back, but he heard the galloping getting louder and closed his eyes. Neither one of us has ever returned to that area at night again. I moved away from North Carolina in 2004. My friend still lives in the area. However, to this day, he does not go up onto the Blue Ridge Parkway at night. He only visits during the day. When we get together, we can't help but talk about all the shit we saw and experienced during that time. We always talk about one day returning to that area at night again. Even though we're scared to death, the curiosity of the unknown draws me. And we both have questioned why those things occurred to us. And we want answers. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog. Just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove. We were going open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking throughout the day, following a creek, and toward the evening, I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. 
She was very much caught in a scent of something and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the woodline. I went about my camp business as usual, and then, at around midnight, I got this prickly feeling, like I was being watched intently. I felt the feeling ride for a little bit, and I kept tinkering with the fire. And then, I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight up the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam, all but the tail. It was a tail that I knew was not supposed to exist in the southern Appalachians. I cast my light again across the hillside, and this time I caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk, and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming and cursing all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridgeline, which would lead us out. Atop the ridgeline in the fresh mud were a series of tracks. Tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern U.S. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by a mountain lion just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing that it had been watching and stalking us throughout the entire previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat tracks, I know those. They were way too big, and so were the eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't given me some red flags, I would have been mauled that night. It remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever, and it just goes to show that sometimes, when you feel that something's creepy and off, it can be a lot scarier than a ghost. So, back in Halloween of the early 2000s, my friends and I were trick-or-treating, as we were only in our freshman or sophomore years of high school. We had taken a walk to a wealthier neighborhood in the hopes that they would have better candy than ours did, and we were supposed to cut through a slightly wooded area into a friend's backyard. My friend Will was leading us through, and he didn't really know the shortcut back. So, we ended up in a very small clearing, just barely still visible from the street. We could still see the street though, so we didn't end up getting lost. The point though, is the house that we found. It was slightly old and definitely abandoned with all of the overgrowth covering it, making it hard to see from the street. We wanted to check it out, as it was Halloween and we figured we should get a little spooked. We did get spooked too, when we peeked through the back screen door and saw a little bit of movement in the pitch black house. But we were already slightly creeped out, so we decided to walk back and take the right shortcut. As we went back, we saw a little bit of movement behind us, and all of us booked it home, being as excitable as we already were. This all happened five months before the actual point of the story occurred. By this time, we had explored the house sealing off the first floor with a door, shower curtain, and weights, as there was some kind of substance in the air that would always make us feel unwell. We made a setup out of the upper floor of the house that we could relax in. We were using it as a spot to hang out, having filled it with battery lamps and chairs, as well as sleeping bags for when we would have get-togethers away from our parents for a long time. But as cozy as we made it, the things that we found in the house creeped us out endlessly. The ones I remember the most were the two closets, one with a hook and a rope on the ceiling, and possibly dried blood on the ground. The other closet was filled with plastic on the walls and what we think was also blood. 
New cleaning supplies were still under the kitchen sink, even though the faucet was removed as well as the oven. There was a functional cotton gin sitting in the empty garage, and a grime-covered knife sitting in the sink. We ignored most of these things, and simply sealed off more rooms that creeped us out. But when we found that knife in the sink, I was worried somebody could use it to attack one of us if they somehow ended up squatting in the hideout we made. So I got the genius idea of going to the absolutely filthy brown and black fluid leaking out of the wall's bathroom that no one would ever think to go in, and throw the knife in the toilet, which was filled with the same grime and sludge. But when I went in, I failed to notice the door, for some reason, ever so gently closing behind me. And as I was looking around the bathroom for a place to hide the knife, the room got thick and cold, except for a slight warmth on my left shoulder. And I was paralyzed. That moment started to feel like hours. Then, ever so quietly, and weakly, and tiredly, I heard a noise in my left ear. Like something that's a cross between a whimper and a dry-throated croak. It seemed filled with more sadness and panic and pleading than I've ever felt in my entire life. I quickly ran out, tossing the knife behind me, and slammed the door shut as hard as I could, feeling a force pull back against me. Then I ran out to my friends who were just outside by the door. We sealed that room up too, and we only went back to clean out our things. We called the police anonymously and the house was searched and a few months later it was demolished. I'd like to say that although the police searched and apparently found nothing, I concretely believe that a woman or maybe some poor girl died in that house. I hope she isn't angry with me. I live in the suburbs of Dublin, Ireland, where I'm surrounded by greenery, beautiful hiking trails, and lots of Celtic mysticism. One particular hiking trail is called the Hellfire Club. There's a lot of stories that have been passed on from generation to generation as to where it got the name, but the most popular, as far as I'm aware, is that on top of the mountain where the trail passes is an old, completely deteriorated stone house. Legend has it that back in the day, it was a hangout spot where men would drink, play cards, and have a merry old time. One night, a group of men were playing cards, and a stranger asked if he could join in. During the game, one of the men dropped a card, bent down to pick it up off the ground, and realized the stranger that had joined them had hoofed feet. So, present day, this trail is very popular for hikers and campers. This particular day, three friends decided to go camping and set up tent beside an old hunting lodge. After a few hours, they noticed that someone had set up camp quite close by. Not weird, but maybe a little odd. This guy decided to approach the three campers and introduce himself, and ended up chatting with them for a few hours. After some time had passed, one of the campers decided that they needed more firewood. The stranger went with him and the other two went off in another direction. As the camper was about to get firewood, he was grabbed from behind by the stranger, who put his left hand across his mouth and attempted to cut his throat with the knife. He was sliced across the throat three times before he managed to push the attacker away. He fell to the ground and was then stabbed in the chest. The knife broke, leaving the blade embedded in his chest. The other two realized something was happening and tried to intervene, one being knocked to the ground and the other escaping to go get help. The cops were called and went searching for the guy who they eventually found. It turned out that he had recently spent a lot of time in a mental institution, suffered from a deep-seated mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia, and he had had an acute psychotic episode that day. As far as I know, he got locked up for a few years, but this happened about 10 minutes away from my house. Horror movies come to life. 
I don't know if these two events are connected, but people say the Hellfire Club in that area, which also happens to be where these people were camping, is cursed. My dad told me this story recently, and I felt the need to share it. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who what you see is what you get, and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons he barely hunts or scouts alone anymore, unless he can't help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell with him still clueless on where he was, tired Frustrated and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was pitch dark, his little flashlight not giving much light. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he may have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing if it was he needed to get the hell out, but not be hasty about it as to spook it if it was a bear. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him in a distance. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up and gaining on him. My dad starts walking faster, and, as I'm sure you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now, maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared shitless, he turns around and shines his flashlight to see nothing, except for huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead, and everything around it that had been living was too. He started freaking out, and straight out sprinted, not caring which way he was going. He just wanted to get as far away from that thing as possible. The footsteps behind him were now following suit, sprinting after him. He only glanced back one more time, seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass and leaves wherever they had landed. By now he's not sure how long or far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that someone can help him if he comes upon a house or store. He breaks out of the woods, and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on her porch, the lights on outside. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading the Bible at this time. As embarrassing as it was for him to admit, he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks. She stood up and looked behind him to see the hoof prints and hear the sounds for herself. She held her hands out to him and he grasped onto them tightly as she pulled him into her. And then she said loudly, you can't have him. He said the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder. So when he looks up, all he can see is where the hoof prints and dead grass and leaves lay. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that it was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know. 
but he's pretty sure that my grandmother saved his life that night. I haven't really had a ton of encounters that I can't explain, but one kind of sticks with me from about a year ago. Last December, I was visiting my family who lives in Poland for the holidays, just some traditional stuff. A couple of days before Christmas, I decided to take a walk in the forest that I used to play in when I was little. There wasn't much going on for the rest of that particular day. It was in the late afternoon, and it was pretty foggy, with overcast skies. The temperature was around 5 degrees Celsius. When I entered the forest, it was normal. I could hear birds chirping and other small animals moving around. About 15 minutes later, it suddenly got really cold. The forest went quiet, and I could see my own breath. I was confused so I checked the weather app on my phone to see if the temperatures matched up. But my phone said it was still 5 degrees, which didn't make any sense, because I could see my breath and my teeth were chattering. Then, when I turned my phone off, I saw my reflection in the screen, but standing behind me was a white figure. I didn't get a great look before I jumped and quickly turned around to find nothing behind me. It scared the shit out of me, so I started running back the way I came. As I ran, I looked back to see the figure calmly walking toward me. Only then did I get a good look at her. It looked like a girl, probably in her late teens or early twenties. She had mid-length curly dark hair and wore a dress that looked like it was from the early 1900s era. It didn't look like she had any eyes just dark holes where the eyes should have been. This scared me even more, so I picked up my pace and ran full speed out of the woods and back to my uncle's house. As I exited the forest, I felt the temperature gradually return to normal. When I entered the house, I was out of breath. None of my family members were home except for my aunt, who was in the other room watching television. I never told them, or anyone, about what happened. I've tried finding a logical explanation for it all, but I just can't. I was always skeptical about ghosts, but I am a superstitious person, especially when it comes to demons or folklore. If anyone knows more about the paranormal than I do, and you know what the hell that thing was, please let me know. This experience has left me feeling extremely shaken, and I would love some opinions, especially from somebody with experience. Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving pretty far into Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam and they're free of charge a trade-off for sketchy and rough drives into the park sometimes, and a lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road, kind of curling up a mountain, around maybe 5 p.m. It was very nice out, sunny and warm with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there, and I even texted my boyfriend about it, for as long as I could, before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but I didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog to look over the edge, and I noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yucca, my dog, started to growl slightly. She is vocal, but I have almost only ever seen or heard her growl at or with other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelled, maybe. 
This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself on being an independent traveler and backpacker. So I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continue to notice more and more dead animals. Keep in mind, no one's going to be driving more than five to 10 miles per hour up this thing. And that's if there's even anybody out there. I hear men's voices. They sound close, and I think that I should call out to them, so I stop my car. But then I kind of freeze up and feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're saying. I don't see any sign of people anywhere. I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone in this deep. The unsettling feeling grows about these voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't even remember how Yucca was acting on the way down. I was scared and focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. A bit dangerously fast for the road, I went back down the mountain not seeing any sign of anybody. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself, and the voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off and they just sounded close. Animals die. Glass gets broken. Nothing happened. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to the feeling I had driving up that mountain. And it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened across some information, as well as some Native American lore, that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I've mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes that it gave me, but nothing much more. I googled the national park ones and didn't see anything, but I didn't look much either. I like scary movies and things of that nature, hence my fascination with this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left, and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to the X-Files and ended up on a true story video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator, and I hear the narrator mention Wendigos. Very briefly says what they are, and casually mentions that they can mimic voices. I mean it when I say the most horrible chills I've ever had in my life crawled down my spine. I stare at my boyfriend and I ask him if he remembers that national forest that I was freaked out about last year. He says he does, and he reminds me that he texted me that I was probably close to a Wendigo. I remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore and I thought he was just being funny. Like, haha, yeah, Bigfoot is stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no, I mean, I was mostly joking, but I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you could find no trace of. I started to feel super strange, and I began googling Wendigos and things like that. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there is a ton of questionable information out there, but I tried to find more reputable websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another Family Goes Missing in Mendocino. I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they're all a little bit hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remembered looking up the forest about a year ago, but I didn't see anything. And I realized that these stories didn't seem to be talked about very much, which also piqued my intuition and interest. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past eight years have gone missing and not been found out there, on top of the many which are found dead. It just has my interest super spiked. 
Remembering how unsafe I felt, how badly I wanted to get out of there, terrifies me. And I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing, and I do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica. So her little growls along the way make me feel like there was something wrong. Even though it was just a storytelling video, these stories originate from somewhere, right? I've had a couple of experience with doppelgangers. The first was when I was about 19. I suddenly woke up from my sleep and immediately had a frightened feeling. I had a wardrobe in front of my bed at the time with a full-length mirror on it. In the mirror, I can see my bed and the windows behind it. In the window behind me, I saw what appeared to be my mom, but she had a seriously twisted look on her face an expression that was creepy and that I've never seen on her before. She was staring at me in the mirror, and for a couple of minutes, all I could do was stare back at her in fear. I thought perhaps I had sleep paralysis, as I have experienced that my whole life, but it turned out that I could move, so I sat up fast and looked out the window, but nobody was there. I looked back into the mirror, and she was gone. It would have been impossible for her to go anywhere, as my room was on the second story, and the window looked out to my balcony, which is only accessible through my room. It's also unlikely that she was able to get onto the balcony through the house. She would have had to come through my room and open the incredibly hard to open, very noisy, banging balcony door that was behind my bed, right by my head. I got out of bed and went to check on my mom who was fast asleep in her bed and clearly had not been through my bedroom or jumped off the second story balcony to go through the front door, up the stairs and back to her room in a matter of a minute or so. I turned all the lights on and I stayed up for the rest of the night. The second time was a few weeks ago. At first, all was fine. I was in bed, woken up in the night and rolled over to hug my boyfriend. Immediately, I felt like it wasn't him. But I didn't want to believe that, and I just wanted to feel comforted. He was making weird noises, and I told him to stop being weird. He then spoke in a voice that was not his. I looked up at him, and he had the same twisted look on his face that my mother's had had. It was even creepier to see it up close. I said, you're not my boyfriend. But I was too scared to move. He tried to convince me for a bit, and I kept asking, who are you? I got out of bed, terrified, and I just kept demanding, Who are you? You're not him. He then got up and started throwing and dragging me around the room while I kept crying, You're not my boyfriend. He managed to drag me out to the hallway, with many moments of pulling and fighting away and him throwing and dragging me. He was a lot stronger than my boyfriend was, and he was laughing, seemed disturbingly amused by all of this. I suddenly jolt and I am in bed sitting up with my heart racing. I thought, thank god, hopefully it was just a dream. But it felt so real, and I was conscious and in control of my actions the entire time, unlike even the most lucid of dreams. Then I thought sleep paralysis, but then how could I move and make decisions? After searching for a phenomenon like this, I've seen a little bit about astral projection. Could that be the case? I thought I would check to see if any of the details in the house were different to my potential dream, but they were the same, including the bumped frame on the wall that was crooked that I had not noticed the day before. I really hope it was just an incredibly vivid dream, but having had experienced sleep paralysis all my life, I'm pretty good at deciphering what is an awake hallucination or sleep paralysis and what's a dream, and it definitely felt like the former. Has anyone experienced something similar or encountered doppelgangers like this before? Does anybody know what this weird dreaming but feeling absolutely awake and lucid thing is? Any feedback is appreciated. It still haunts me.
I have a doppelganger that's been following me for a while. The first story was when I was just about seven or eight. It was a summer afternoon, and my friends and I went inside our house to drink water and use the restroom. The restroom on the first floor is right beside the stairs, so when I got out, I saw my friends staring up, and they seemed really surprised when I came out of the restroom. When I asked them why, they told me that I had run upstairs and that they were waiting for me to come down. I told them it must have been my grandma they saw, but they both insisted that it was me. I was so young that it was trivial for me and I just urged them to continue our game outside. In the same house, I was a college student this time. It's a weekend and I just woke up and felt a call of nature. My room was beside the hallway leading to our second floor bathroom. So I went in there, turned the corner, and I saw our maid cleaning. I excused myself as the hallway isn't big enough and she let me pass. I then went to the restroom and two minutes later our maid knocked and asked if I was still in there. I said yes and she left. I was curious and right afterwards I asked her about it. She was hesitant at first, but she told me anyway. She said she was waiting for me to wake up so she could clean my room. When I passed by her, she thought it was her chance and went straight into my room. When she entered, I was standing there, my back facing her, and she got creeped out when I was about to face her and she bolted out of the room. That's why she went back to the restroom to see if I was still there. The third story happened when I had just moved into a new house, sorting out where things should go. I think it was our second day there. We just finished breakfast and I volunteered to wash the dishes. It was just my mom and I that time. My mom then approached me and asked, were you here the whole time? I said, yeah, I've been washing dishes and organizing utensils in the kitchen. She said, then who helped me carry the mattress to our room? She had a very skittish smile on her face and was obviously scared. She swore that it was me who had carried it with her, but obviously that was impossible. Finally, I've been sharing this story where I see fit and I'll tell it here too. I moved into a new house with a friend. It's just a small one bedroom gated apartment. I was inside the room surfing the net and my roommate was in the living room watching K-drama. I heard the door open and close and the gate as well. After a few minutes, I heard the gate open and it was my roomie's boyfriend. He asked her where I was and my roommate told him that I had gone to my boyfriend's house. I heard them talking and I shouted, hey, I'm here. They both ran to the room and my roommate had this bewildered look on her face. I asked her what happened and she said, you passed by me and told me that you were staying at your boyfriend's. And I looked at you and nodded and you left. I told her that I heard the door and the gate close a while ago and she said it must have been that, but obviously I hadn't left or spoken to her. Her boyfriend stayed over that night as we were both pretty scared that the doppelganger would come back. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five miles to town, down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside of the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too. I never really was in the main house at all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep for all the noise. Floorboards creaking, thumps and knocks, that kind of thing. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered around. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. 
It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you imagine a fairy might make. It would come from a different direction each time I sought it. I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about in the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there, in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and fro by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, though. Deer run away and crash about doing it. I was a big-time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork until three or four in the morning. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh twenty inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks and see if I couldn't locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get in, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call it a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 in the morning. I can still see it on top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out and noted that the clouds were dispersed a bit and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods when something caught my eye. It looked just like a silhouette of somebody leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see somebody with a palm planted against a wall with the arm straight out, leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or the lighting is funny, or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped off onto the fresh snow, it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on that tree put the thing at seven feet. It ran along the border of the fence and back off into the woods. It was hairless, as far as I can tell, and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a tall, skinny man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up what had to be a set of size 14 or 15 barefoot tracks. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then, the tracks just ended, about 20 feet short of the wood line. I don't know if it jumped to the tree line or what. It probably could have, but there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It was like it just vanished. Never could explain that one. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy. This one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and things like that, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we would use llamas or mules to pack our gear. 
All the while, we would sleep in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail, near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington state. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macabre Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves, meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal, before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here for over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal was to allow guided tours to take place at some time in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain wasn't difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we would need on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days. Usually we started our morning hike at around 7 a.m. and we began our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse at around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we could call the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point the weather had turned, and we'd be lucky to see two to three people in an entire day doing the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around 4 p.m., and my co-worker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark. My rationale being that the more trips I did today, the less I would have to do tomorrow. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun started to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and making visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily. Having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry, I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and even ran into a few demented hillbillies over the years. As I left the prairie that evening, though, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. 
goosebumps erupted from my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I found myself wanting to walk faster, to jog, and then to sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself that I had been reading far too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so before I started to hear something faint, something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and still at least two miles from civilization. That civilization, in reality, being likely the only other soul out there, my co-worker. Sure enough, however, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faint, I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it. The steps on the wooden boardwalk were too loud and covered it up. Every time I paused to hear it, it became unmistakable. It got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the noises of life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. It was as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods, certain places have it, but this was different somehow, unique to this location, unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't quite recognize the composition. Unsurprising, since I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow I felt that it was meant just for me in this moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of the music. And then, as quickly as it came, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation, and weight of everything was just lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life, somehow, was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, nor did I sense anything unusual. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another park service employee. I told my grandfather about what happened. He was a retired park ranger who had worked at nearby Mora just the next station over. Without the least bit of hesitation, he goes, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or just the piano this time? When I was working as a backpacking guide in western North Carolina, my schedule dictated a full eight-day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other co-workers would play in the woods. In the summer, you can't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of our favorites was called Paradise Falls, alternately called Wolf Creek Falls. This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool. Even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is nine feet at most, 
you have to work through a ten-minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon, you can't see the main pool. Well, we got to the jump and coaxed the first person off, a fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area beyond our eyesight, and then screamed. Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guide jumped in together and swam the short distance to her with others in tow. Of course, we figured she was injured somehow. She was treading water and just staring, wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, I saw what she had screamed at. There stood a man. He was massively large, easily 6'6 and a little change. He wore beat-up overalls and no shirt. There didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin Man, but made of flesh. His face, his arms, his chest, everything had a uniform layer of shingled fat rolls. And he was brandishing a shotgun. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and stuff it in a bag. He stood and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back toward the parking area, and never said a word. I'm a bow hunter, and I still like to hunt, but something that happened to me last October makes me never want to hunt again. I was coming down a hill into a marshy area. It was kind of late, and the side of the mountain was covered in shadows. I live in Pennsylvania, where our mountains are completely covered in trees, and it gets dark fast. When I went to the bottom of the hill, I noticed that it was completely silent, no sounds at all, and I felt the hairs stand up on my arms, but I've been creeped out before in the woods, so it wasn't too much of a big deal. I kept on. I've been hunting in this general area before, but I'd never gone down this particular hill. I continued creeping through the woods, mind you I'm walking very slowly, so you can barely hear my footsteps. Deer are hard to sneak up on. Then I hear a voice call out from behind me from a small thicket of trees. Help! And then my name. Come over here. I'm in trouble. Help! I swear it sounded just like my brother's voice, and I almost ran to it. But then I realized my brother lives in Nevada. There's no way it could be him. The second thing that creeped me out in that moment was that this thing said my name. It only took me a second to realize that something wasn't right, and when I did, I ran faster than I ever have in my life. Only my dad knew where I was hunting that day, and the area is so huge that nobody would have found me out there, and he's too old to have played any tricks on me like that. But something out there knew my name, and it sounded just like my brother. I don't know what the hell that was, but I don't think I'll ever be going back into the woods again. Maybe I'll move to the desert with my brother, where at least I can see everything around me. Here's a little bit of background to start. I'm from Texas and my boyfriend is from Maine. We both live in Texas now in a decently sized city outside of Dallas. But during the summer, 
we attempt to escape the heat and visit his family in Maine for a few weeks. I had my fair share of experiences growing up in a haunted house, so I was raised as a believer. Weird things seem to happen frequently, but I don't like to automatically attribute it to a ghost or whatever. I'd like to think that I'm a fairly logical person, and I like to try to debunk weird things. That being said, my boyfriend is pretty skeptical and doesn't spook easily, so that makes this story even more interesting. At around 11 p.m. one night, he and I were sitting on his dad's front porch, just chit-chatting. The porch is raised and looks down over a backyard that runs to the tree line at the edge of a thick woods. We were just hanging out, sober, I might add, when we heard what sounded like an adolescent boy singing scales. La 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 la. Over and over. It was just background noise, and honestly, we were so used to living in an apartment in the city back home that we didn't think anything of it. In fact, we were annoyed. My boyfriend actually said, do you think he knows we're here? That could be awkward. I laughed. And then I realized what we were listening to. We were hearing what sounded like a boy, in the woods, late at night, walking back and forth in the dark woods, singing scales repeatedly. My boyfriend was still bent on the idea that he should give the guy some warning that he had an audience. So kind of mockingly, he sings back, la 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 la. The boy sang the same thing back from the trees. It sounded like whoever it was was instantly standing right at the tree line beside us. It was loud and sounded as if whoever, or whatever it was, had instantly covered a huge amount of space to go from somewhere in the woods to just a few feet away from us. We both instantly had the fight or flight response and, without even thinking or discussing it, we both jumped up as if we were going to run into the house. Something about it felt weird, and we had flipped a switch from harmless, awkward fun to terrified. There's a house back there, right? I asked my boyfriend. There has to be, he said back. We were spooked and went into the house anyway. We both couldn't stop thinking about it, and suddenly the details began to sink in about just how weird this actually was. First, if that was an actual person, we would have heard them stomping around in the woods. It sounded as if they were pacing back and forth over an area of about 20 feet, and the woods were thick. You couldn't walk through them without making a ruckus and cracking leaves and twigs. Second, there were no lights through the trees. If that was actually a 12 or 13 year old boy, unless he has a night vision, he would have needed a flashlight to accompany him, especially if he was taking such careful steps as to not make a sound. If there was a flashlight, we would have seen it through the dark. Third, how did he instantly cover that much space to get right beside us at the tree line? I know that voices can be carried on the wind and sound distorted, but there was no wind that night. It also sounded enough like a real person, not a floating voice on the wind, that we both just automatically assumed that there was actually a boy out there. Lastly, we asked his dad where in the woods his neighbor's house was. He just looked at us and said, What neighbors? I don't have neighbors. There's not a house back there for miles. People in Maine don't tend to have close neighbors, but the next day we went back and checked anywhere. As far as we could go, there was no sign of people anywhere. I had an interesting experience while camping with my husband a couple of weeks ago. It was a nice drive in a campsite, a corner spot next to one of the other campsite and woods on the other three sides. We had a nice day hiking and cooked some fajitas and s'mores over the fire, and then we settled into our tent to sleep. Later that night, I woke up and heard a weird noise. 
It sounded kind of like an electronic tone, and then I heard what sounded like people talking right outside of the tent. They better get out of that tent. I saw a possum go in there. Thinking that there must be other campers walking around, I turned over and tried to go back to sleep. A couple minutes later, I heard a strange noise again, the same one, and then what sounded like a cat meowing and walking around the tent. It sounds like my cat when he wants to be let into the house. Now I'm not about to let strange animals into my tent, so I just laid there and it stopped after about a minute. A couple of minutes later, I heard the tone once again, and then I heard a lower, gravelly voice talking outside the tent. They better get out of there before I get them. All of this happened over the course of maybe 10 minutes. I didn't react as strongly as I probably should have, but I was tired and thought at first that it might be some kind of dream. My husband got up and left the tent to use the bathroom a little while later. He hadn't heard anything and I didn't hear anything else after that. The next morning while eating breakfast, I could hear the neighboring campers talking. One of their children, about five to seven years old, was upset with his brother because they'd clearly heard somebody telling them to get out of the camper last night. He was arguing with his brother, who was vehemently denying that he had heard anything at all. I'm not sure what exactly happened that night, but it was interesting. This really happened, and it's one of the most unnerving things I've ever experienced. So it was the 4th of July, and my brother and I were setting off fireworks in the woods behind our house. We were passing back and forth an aim and flame cigarette lighter, and lighting firecrackers and other small fireworks. It was around 2 in the morning, so technically the 5th of July. I left to get something to drink, and left my brother there lighting the fireworks as usual. I get back around 10 minutes later, and he asks me for the lighter. I told him that I didn't have it, I'd left it with him, and he was actively lighting firecrackers as I left. He says, yeah I know, but I just gave it to you a couple minutes ago, where is it? I know my brother, this isn't something he would lie about. We've talked about this many times over the years and his story has never changed. The moon was bright that night bright enough to see by. He says he saw me, in my same outfit, same face, same hair, and everything, come out, say nothing, and put my hand out. My brother assumed I was waiting on the lighter, so he gave me the lighter, and whatever it actually was walked away, never speaking a word. These woods were privately owned by my family, far out in rural Texas. Nobody else was out there, and if they were, it still doesn't explain how they looked identical to me. We continued setting off firecrackers until about four in the morning, having to use a short cigarette lighter because that thing stole the aim and flame. We never did find it either. So this really only started happening this morning. At around 6 a.m. I got out of bed to get ready for work. While I was in the bathroom getting ready, my boyfriend was still in bed. Suddenly I heard him and it sounded like he was afraid of something in the bedroom. I walked back into the bedroom to see if he was okay. When I asked him what was wrong, he seemed pretty shaken up. After a few seconds, I was able to get him to explain what had happened. When he was just starting to wake up, he stated that he saw the spirit of an older lady that seemed to be cussing him out for no apparent reason. After he told her to go away, she did. But not long after this, while he was half asleep, he thought that I was laying on the bedroom floor and reaching up to run my hand across his chest. As he started to wake up though, he started to realize something about it was really off. He said that she was laying way too far away to realistically reach up and touch him at all. I mean, her arm would have had to have been like five feet long. And with that, he said that her features seemed kind of blurry. 
She also had a wide-eyed, emotionless stare, kind of uncanny valley-esque. He described it as if somebody had built an animatronic version of me. Later on in the day, after I got home from work, I got up from the edge of our bed to open the bedroom door for the cat. According to my boyfriend, my doppelganger showed up again, but this time she was standing at the foot of our bed and directly staring in the direction of actual me over by the bedroom door. From what we understand, whatever is trying to copy me is definitely trying to fool my boyfriend into a false sense of security. The bad thing though is that we're also pretty sure this is some kind of hostile presence. If anybody has any advice or information on what this may or may not be, especially if you know how to deal with it, we'd love to know. This was six years ago, when I was in primary school. It was after lunch, and my friend and I were walking up the stairs to our classroom on the third floor. On the first staircase, we saw one of the two gym teachers coming down and greeted him. As we got to the second floor and up the staircase, I had a fleeting thought. Wouldn't it be weird if we suddenly saw him walking down again? But then, he actually did come down the stairs. My friend and I were so shocked, we just stood there gaping at him as he looked at some papers while walking down. He didn't really acknowledge us or seem to notice us staring at him. We were frozen until he disappeared under the stairs, and that's when I snapped out of it and peered down. I couldn't see him, but he might have just walked closer to the wall or in the middle of the stairs. I had half a mind to run after him, but I've always thought it best to not interfere with the supernatural. I had heard of doppelgangers before. I was creeped the hell out anyway. So we ran to our class, still trying to process it all, while repeatedly asking each other, did you see that? They were completely identical, except that one had papers with him. We debated him having a twin, but really that was just silly. We'd been at that school for five years and we never heard about that. Plus, they were wearing the exact same outfit and the school only had three gym teachers. If they were, by some almost non-existent chance, actual twins, we would have heard of the gossip, or they would have walked together instead of one floor apart. We tried debating if he ran through the hallway after we saw him on the first staircase, but even if he was a gym teacher, there's no possible way, and there's no reason to go past us, run down a hallway and up two staircases, and then down the hall to meet us again, just to freak somebody out. Maybe he did run up again to get the papers, but the time between meeting was at the very most 20 seconds. There was just no way. I haven't heard of him after graduation because we all drifted away, but I don't think anything happened to him. It was just weird, and one of my childhood memories that I think back on with curiosity. Another time close to that, we had an extra class day on Saturday. I took the morning off because of family business, but when I came to class, my classmates asked me where I'd gone. I told them that I'd never been there, that I took the morning off, but all of them said they had seen me at class that morning. Apparently, I even went to the bathroom with the class's vice rep. I immediately had a thought and asked her if I was pulling my lips in my mouth. I had this weird habit of pulling my lip inside in the bathroom because I didn't want to get germs stuck to my lips and then lick them up. I know, it's weird. Anyway, she said no. She was genuine and I could see the confusion on her face, like what was that question for? She was a really serious girl and wouldn't participate in a prank for someone she wasn't close to, if at all. In fact, the whole class couldn't be in on it because that would be a really random prank. And even if it was, no one would ever really do anything like that. They just weren't that type. There were many divided groups in the class, so the chances of them all working together is zero. Especially against me, who only hung out with two kids and almost never interacted with anybody. So, weird? If anyone has any encounters with doppelgangers, I'd love to hear about it. I'm not entirely sure if it was a doppelganger, but 
I really can't think of what else it would be. The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs, except the back end of it borders a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friends and I would always play. One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like very overgrown dozer tracks. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central and eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We had probably made a mile of progress into this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say that it was a pond because it was perfectly round like a crater. The water had obviously receded and in the middle of it was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next, a door. A full car door, half buried under pine duck, riddled with bullet holes and shot. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the south, go out, have a few beers with your buddies and see some old junk. But what we found next wasn't a run-of-the-mill Saturday night. Bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white-tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side. I'm not sure if our objective was to make a museum quality deer skeleton or what, but that's what we did. Then, the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately, because my uncle was a chiropractor and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would always look at. The more I started to look at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got this weird gut feeling, and being the oldest, I told everybody to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone that this was the best thing to do. We hiked back the way we'd been coming in and went back to the pool down the road, finished out the day and went home. But I couldn't stop thinking about those bones. That night, I told my mom about what we had found. Then I had to tell dad the story. At first, they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors, going back and forth. The next day, I told the story to two sheriff's deputies and took them to the area where we had entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles packing the tiny dead end leading off to the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush, and men in white shirts with detective badges smoked cigarettes and talked amongst each other, as men carried bags from the forest and put them into vehicles. Then they were gone. I waited months to hear something, anything, nothing. I asked my parents what had happened, did they figure it out, and over time, their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I came home from college and I was sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. He saw everything I saw. We started talking about it after a few beers and got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day, and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. Whatever happened that day, whatever they found, it was intentionally buried and forgotten. To this day, they all hold adamant that it never happened, but we hold adamant that it did.
When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains and not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road except for our campsite. We parked at the entrance and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp, and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then turned in. Not long afterward, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored, loudly, like walls of the tent shaking snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road, where the reception was a little better, and where we would actually be able to hear the radio over the snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck, with its lights off, appeared out of the woods and passed us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and we even briefly called in to say hi. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from the right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off. Then, it shuts off its engine and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, not even bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cooled off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear her breathing. I could hear that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It felt like it was a really long time, it had to be at least ten minutes that went by, but it could have been a half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck starts up again, and then backs up along the narrow, dirt road. It never turned its lights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit! But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning just as we had planned. And yes, we checked with the park, and they don't own any black, unmarked SUVs. Nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. To this day, we have no idea who they were or what they wanted.
This is my father-in-law's experience. This happened to him probably 10 years ago at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we're headed there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting. He told me to go ahead and share his story. It's short, but as I get a little creeped out in the woods as it is, this would have freaked me out. So as some people probably know, you get out an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, a ladder leading up to a seat in a tree, usually fairly deep in the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law has been in his stand for a couple of hours, and it was getting light. He was reading a book as he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She's calling, Hunter, oh Hunter, in a very sing-songy voice almost like a mother calling her child in for dinner as he played outside. Now, as I said, he's pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket getting to your stand, which is why you go out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out, followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling to him. That's the only way she would have gone unnoticed. At first, he thought that the woman was calling someone named Hunter, maybe her son. She called again, and that's when he realized that he is the hunter. So he turns around, peers into the trees, and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater and asks if he can come down and look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't quite set in yet, and he's a give-you-the-shirt-off-his-back kind of guy, not to mention 6'2", nearing 300 pounds and carrying a gun, so he wasn't too worried about a small woman. He starts getting down the tree to go have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting land, probably a 10-minute walk. She walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, so he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in to say hello. No answer. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see that there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out of a valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring out onto the floor. He walks over, turns off the valve, sticks his head in the house to say hello again, and nothing. No answer. The house seems completely empty. Empty of people, anyway, but it's a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is, and decides that this is just the sort of situation that gets you robbed and murdered. He nopes out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now, we've hunted this land for years, and we've never seen anybody at this place. Although until this season, it has shown obvious signs of being lived in. So, every time I pass her place, which backs right up to the road we take to our hunting stands, I always wonder about her. I'm not entirely sure if she's actually a real woman, or if maybe it was some ghost or something trying to get him to go there for a particular reason. But... It was a creepy experience, nonetheless. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky. It runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc. And we camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most times. The first night was uneventful, Except to say that there's nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. 
The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon, about 30 feet wide and so deep the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, but not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower-pitched at the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere Kentucky, most likely it was a fox, or a boar, or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap, not a single leaf crinkle, when, whatever it was, finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but no one had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided this would have to do, as we didn't want to go farther down the river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split into two, and in the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass, and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed at around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 to 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. I was having a dream, but suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all just decided that it was a falling tree and went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river, one last time, to head home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. 
No mysterious forest noises. No crashing. No metallic groaning in the middle of the night. Nothing. To both my disappointment and relief. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area, as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, Vlad the Impaler, and others. They were all once residing here and fighting battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover. And the First and Second World Wars had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak magic, or Vlaska magia, inhalation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorites was a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest, in a small and old house that was about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if it was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits the house and stays overnight here. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be here. I can't imagine staying here overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very weird story. While he stays there, he gets visited often. At first, I thought visits like the one you get from neighbors or something. But he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling on his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him, using his hand to just crawl across his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair, and the hand felt very soft, my grandfather always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time he told me that he used to fix small parts around his house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave with his tractor because it takes about an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him, until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't so much as frown. They expect you to react. Do not give them this pleasure, is what he told me while laughing. It makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really runs in our family, experiencing from time to time such encounters. 
The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual stories from the past, how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. Since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motorcycle and drove out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about things, you know? To be in this type of state that you don't have to question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I find myself driving to the old house he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are very widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dusk, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared, so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought that I was invincible. In fact, even a vampire wouldn't cross my path, that I would ease past with him to no harm. There aren't really any streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to pretty much nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road starts to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. I thought maybe it was a bug, that I had squished it, but it was just too much blood. So I started to look at my hand for wounds but my hand seemed to be perfectly fine. My heart slowly started racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my entire life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It seemed like somebody was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down or make a mistake. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I have a ton of stories regarding these kinds of events. Also, we have a few witches in our family that used to practice black magic. It was taught to them by their ancestors. One year, when I was about 15, I went to a scout camp at Bear Lake in Idaho. I haven't forgotten about it since. To this day, I believe I saw a dragon. The whole week we were there, it had been mostly sunny and warm. But one day, it got really cloudy and stormy. It started out as a drizzle during the day, but quickly turned into a torrential downpour at night. The camping site that our troop was assigned to was right on the bank of the lake, toward the south end. Anyway, I woke up in the middle of the night. It was pitch black, and the wind was howling like a chorus of upset toddlers. The reason I woke up? I had to pee like crazy. So we have this buddy rule that if you go anywhere, you have to bring your assigned buddy with you, especially at night. It didn't get the name Bear Lake for nothing after all. So I wake up my buddy and tell him I need to pee. He groggily says, Are you freaking serious? When he saw me wriggling like a madman, he got out of his sleeping bag and grabbed his flashlight and jacket. We get our boots on and unzip the tent. Instantly, we're drenched. We start walking toward the outhouse. When about midway there, we hear this loud-ass roar. Thinking it was a bear, we started to panic. We turned around, but couldn't see anything with our flashlights. Suddenly, a flash of lightning illuminates the sky, and we see this creature with a massive wingspan, 
a long neck, and a spiked tail. As it flew over us, we could see the silhouette of it, its wings in a downbeat. As it passes, the air from the downbeat literally pushed us into the mud. Terrified, we run back to the tent and hide. Needless to say, I completely forgot about having to pee until the next morning. To this day, my friend and I still talk about what we saw, and we both agree that it was a dragon. It was 2009 in my summer holidays when I was eight years old. As usual, for many years, my family and I went to Córdoba, Argentina and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened in that cabin, like moving objects, strange noises, or even things that just outright disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when suddenly I got up in the middle of the night. When I looked in front of me, an old, careless, and creepy woman was looking at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran into my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day I started talking with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises that he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision I had. He just casually looks at me and says, You're not the first one that that happens to. Many people have reported visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. This story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a U.S. Air Force Security Forces Airman, military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads that we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, and eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on, and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen or heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of a tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed that he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small, one-man tent was set back into the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, 
and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in the area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely somebody camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp. Should we need to leave in a hurry, he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees toward the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent, the tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. Let's go, let's get the fuck out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Taurus on the road blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way he had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper, stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing was all gone, though he could tell that people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to that area, and I don't intend to. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just liked being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad had lived there for quite a while, so they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe about 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. We played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. I can't explain it. I just felt really uneasy. The day faded away into early evening and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad packed up his fishing gear and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up the steep road was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we came up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, 
and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking that it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again, and whispered to one another about what it could be, but still kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep, wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods, to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and slept with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent, and he was in his own tent not that far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night, hearing something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because there was a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big, as I could hear its weight, if that makes any sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep and heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop, this went on for who knows how long, but it felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened, until eventually I somehow fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft, and in some places it was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind when camping. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. I've had these pictures for a few years and finally thought that I would share them. These were captured on a couple of different motion-activated trail cams on the same night, and appear to show the same girl carrying a bag of some sort. These pictures were taken by somebody that my dad used to work with, who sent them to my dad, who then sent them to me. So I can't be entirely sure that these are legitimate, but I have no real reason to doubt them. I don't think they were shared with many people, and I can't find them posted anywhere else online. According to my dad, this guy, who is a hunter who is using the cameras to see wildlife in the area, was so freaked out by these pictures and other strange occurrences at his home that he wanted to sell his property and leave the area. His property is in western Wisconsin. I did notice that one of the pictures is dated 2014, and another is dated 2015. I can't make out the date on the third picture since it's a picture of the guy's computer and the date is cut off. I still have the email from when my dad sent me these pics and I received them in September of 2014. So the picture dated 2015 has to be showing the wrong date. I'm not sure what to make of that dating error, but I still think the three pics together show some pretty convincing evidence of a ghost. The other interesting thing about these pictures is that apparently there was an ATV accident in these woods and a young woman was killed. The guy living on the property who captured these pictures showed them to a friend who was one of the EMTs at the scene of the accident, and he thought the girl in the pictures was dressed similarly to the girl who died in that accident. I have absolutely no idea when this accident occurred or the specifics of the location so again, I cannot be sure that this is credible information. 
I've tried researching it, but I can't seem to find anything. So the girl in these pictures is still a mystery. I've had many of my own paranormal experiences near this area, in small town, middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. So I definitely believe these pictures could be showing a ghost, but I'm not 100% convinced. I'd love to hear others' opinions on this, so I just wanted to share the story and the photos and see what you all think. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in Bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Wurriyalak, Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said that we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up to our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones, some so old that they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was likely that they were cow bones. We came up with a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other, and then built our fire, even burning a couple of the wood-like bones just to see what would happen and settled in. I was woken up by one of my buddies at about 1 a.m. who said that he swears he saw a torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. My dad was clearly doing an awesome job. I really hammed it up, making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners. The light from the torch fixed on our tent, then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside, and my buddies were on the verge of tears. Then we started hearing whispering outside, as well as some low mumbling. Did Dad bring friends on this prank? Dedicated. The torch light came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent? That didn't seem right. I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely, about an hour after it began. We sat in total silence aside from the sobbing of my buddies, and at dawn, we packed up and got out of there. We got back out to the house, and Dad was there. He apologized and said that he had planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened, and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44 gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was freaking creepy. Back in 2003, when I was 12 or so, my parents and I went on a road trip to Tasmania. At one point during the trip, we stayed over two nights in a modest caravan park. It seemed to have originally been built in the 70s with some refurbishments here and there. Standard budget cabin layout, sliding glass door entry to the kitchen and living area, hallway with a three bed bunk on the right, bathroom on the left through to main bedroom with double bed. After we turned in for the night, I found myself laying awake, well after my parents had fallen asleep. Nothing new though, I've always had insomnia. It was dark enough that I could only see vague shapes in the gloom. I could hear, through their open door, each of their distinct sleep sounds. Personalized pace, depth, intermittent snoring, and the like. 
Being a tiny cabin, they were mere meters away from me. I had gleefully taken the top bunk so as to be the warmest because it was a bit cool. The bunk was a little bit irritating, being made of pine. It would creak loudly at the joints. But that wasn't a deal breaker. I'm not fussy. At one point, I chose to lay on my left side, facing the wood veneered wall. I toss a lot when I'm trying to fall asleep, but this time I was refraining. I didn't want to make the bunks creak and wake my light sleeping mom. I limited my rolling. So I faced the wall, one ear planted into the pillow, trying to not give in to the urge to flip over again, trying to drift off in vain. After a while, I was aware that I could now hear a third person breathing in addition to my parents. I was confused. It must be my own breath echoing as I was facing the wall, but how can a tiny cabin echo like that with its compact, wood veneered, linoleum floored, linen covered furniture nature? It confused and annoyed me as I couldn't figure it out. And it was a little bit louder than my parents' collective breathing. So as an experiment, I held my breath. Still, I heard three separate bodies breathing in the cabin. I thought to myself, okay, it's my parents breathing echoing weirdly. I'm too tired to try and ponder as to how it doesn't make any sense, but I'm tired and I don't care and I just want to sleep. I carefully rolled over the bunk creaking so as to perhaps point my top ear in a different direction. With my top ear pointed in a bit of a different position, I could still hear the inexplicable additional breathing. As soon as I registered how truly weird this was and started to actually get spooked, I heard a sound. It was a sort of cough and also sort of a sigh combined. It was nothing akin to my parents' voices and nothing had interrupted their rhythmic breathing. This sound came from directly across my face, as though somebody was standing beside the bunks facing me. In an instant, my heart rate, breathing, and body temperature all increased. Thanks, adrenaline. I couldn't see anything. There was nobody there. At least nobody I could see thanks to the minimal light. I spent the rest of the night drifting in and out of sleep, with the blanket covering my hands, blocking my ears. I had cold flushes of fear and squeezed my eyes shut. I didn't tell my parents the next day. The next night I asked if I could sleep on the sofa in the kitchen and living area. I was not braving that bunk again. I need sleep. I scored. The sofa was actually a sofa bed and the cabin had an old clock radio. My folks and I had adventures during the day and I turned in for the night once more. I set up the sofa bed. Not really comfy, but I'm not hard to cater for. It was fine. I set the clock radio over to the other side of the room and turned on a local radio station. Also not a great station, but I'm easy. My parents went to bed a little bit before I did. I was still fussing about. Not much later, maybe 15 minutes later, I eventually turned the lights off and climbed into the sofa bed. As soon as I set my butt on that bed, the radio turned to static. I got up and switched the light on to tune the radio. It had a manual turn dial for tuning. As soon as I set it again, switched the light off and sat down, the tuning was thrown. Eventually I gave up, turned it off and buried my head under the blankets the whole night. I didn't sleep. I didn't tell my mom about this odd occurrence until about 10 years later. It might be a mundane story, but it definitely rattled me given that it felt so inexplicable, and still does. I can't understand how it happened, and that's why it bothers me so much. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, 
I remember that we were playing a game at night which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, which was just a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base. This was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods. We had to make sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders with their flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep into the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everybody should return to camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided it would be funny to try to scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child after the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I had decided to carry on making growling noises, but then the silhouette turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face-planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front of me. I jogged a bit to catch up with them to make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they should have been, there was no trace of anybody. Confused, I looked around for a while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of somebody running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They'd just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone, and didn't really tell anybody about this until years later when it clicked in my brain that things did not add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp which is probably unrelated but is still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the ground heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, and others, such as Vlad the Impaler. All of them once resided here and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups were formed, killing even more people. Many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are so many occurrences of the paranormal there. Magic is very common here. The so-called Vlak Magic, or Vlaska Magia, in Valachian is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and so many people practice it religiously and believe in it there. As a result, there are many stories about the paranormal events that happen there. One of my favorite ones was a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house. It was about 300 years old. 
He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight here. This place creeps me out, even during the day. There's just an aura to this place that makes it feel uncomfortable. I can't imagine staying here overnight. But he frequently does, and one day he told me a very weird story. While he was staying there, and whenever he does, he often gets visited. At first I thought of visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me no. One night he woke up with a hand crawling on his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling his hand across his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we use to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way he wasn't evil. Another time he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave with his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't even bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time that they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He just told me that he turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He laughed and then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really runs in our family, experiencing them from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from his past, of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motorbike and drove into the forest. Driving around was the only time that I could really think about stuff, you know? and be in the kind of state that you question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I'm a kid, pure by heart, no evil can come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. As I mentioned, I live in East Serbia where vampires are widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dawn, but I didn't really care so I kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared and not get lost in the woods, but being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible, and in fact, even if a vampire would cross my path, that I would ease past him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems to be nothing. After an hour, even the dirt roads start to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, though, I saw that there was blood all over it. I thought it might be a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood. I started looking for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly started to race and increased in pace, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remembered this to be the moment that I was most scared in my whole life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It seemed like someone was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I have a ton of stories regarding these events. Living in the Wallachian forest, you run into a lot of this stuff. 
But to this day, that was still the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll just give you the facts of what happened and you can draw your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I am from Russia originally, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, so I was really excited about this proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying much attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep already, and like I said, it was pouring buckets. Eventually we stumbled on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that that was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. In fact, it sounded like a baby. It's a forest, so a lot of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and kept forward. Within seconds, we heard the cry right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud it could have been just a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking at the trees, but absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound started up right next to us again, like something was telling us to book it. So we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We finally made it back to the entrance of the woods. We both agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started popping up. Turns out the place was the site of an ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about that cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think this is a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks and since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along, thinking that at the very least I might be able to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now, there are no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and the flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actual deep part of the forest, and as soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but there was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, says that there's nothing out here. And then all of a sudden he stops. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic. One that I've never felt before in a forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. 
We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly we hear crunching coming toward us from the dark. At this point, the feeling gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. Ryan says, I was just nervous because it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Sure. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side, and that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looked to be either Native American or a mix of Asian and Latina, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure, but there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers, but I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost, so I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we get to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips and nodded. I was hit with that same feeling that I got back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, screw it. My sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, then at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat, and next to Ryan, who's kind of a flirt, and he started to chatter up, asking where she's from and what she's doing. All this time, I'm turned halfway around, keeping an eye on her, because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's making eye contact with me the whole time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, vibrating, I don't know, but it just seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except that there are no bars anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car, all along nothing but forest. If she was going to walk home, she would have walked around two hours, all on highway. My eyes hurt for making eye contact with her, and she just kept smiling and undulating. This feeling of dread just kept increasing. Eventually, we dropped her off at her street. Lots of old-looking, smaller houses. And when I turned back to look at her a second later, she was gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away, and that's about it, for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10-day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography, and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate, so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park. We were above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. 
We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. Any explanations? I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it was pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're not strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere. Seeing as there is a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby, we don't ever go out there. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into that room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal, so another officer in his own car and I went out there. We were sent out being guided over radio by dispatch. And when we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe around nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly talking to people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, lots of things can go wrong with a taser. And as soon as we opened the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful on the ears, and it caused us to run to the room from which it was coming, yelled in that we were the police, and entered. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops. Just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood, though. Nothing seemed to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty, looked under the bed, nothing there. We poked around for as long as we felt necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out to help. We left, went back to the station and wrote up our written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratches on the walls and footsteps ever since, as well as nightmares. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, trying to see if Ambien or something will keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody, since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. Does anybody have any idea what the cause of this may have been? I'm leaning towards some elaborate prank of some kind, but it just seems odd. It would have taken way too much effort and coordination to actually fake that. And for what? It wouldn't have been worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the gas station coming up to our gas stations and filling up gas cans, putting them in the back of his pickup 
and driving back toward the highway with them. I also asked around at the post office, and they said that they do occasionally get mail to and from that area, but mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway from it. I have been having trouble finding any official records related to it at all, aside from one case file from the early 90s, way before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. I don't know what it was, ghost town, something else, but it's haunted me ever since. This all happened back when I was 14 years old and living in England with both of my parents. My dad was out to work and my mom had just come back from the shop after maybe 30 minutes of me being home alone. Although I wasn't exactly home alone. I was babysitting our neighbor's infant, who was only six months old. Since it was winter, it was a bit chilly outside, so I had the heater on full blast inside the flat and went out to help my mom unload some things from the car. All that while being wrapped in several layers of long sleeves and jackets. The way our flat is built is a two-story, somewhat skinny building that has two rooms. Mine being on the second floor, with a window facing the place that my mom was parked. That is where Sarah, the infant, was taking her nap, so that was easy for me to keep an eye on her while my mom was out. From where we were going in and out with the bags, we could see the top of Sarah's crib and the rest of my room with it. When we were almost finished unpacking the groceries and my mom was inside putting some of them away, I got a huge chill down my back, causing me to drop one of the bags. Doing this, I had the instinct to look up at the window where Sarah was, and I froze with fear. There was a man standing there and staring down at her. He looked older, almost bald, and very skinny. He was also very tall, maybe six feet. I could see him slowly reaching into the crib, but his face was harder to see, and looked completely pale and lifeless. I had been frozen for maybe 20 seconds when I jumped out of my daze and sprinted into the house, going straight past my mom without thinking of telling her to call the cops or telling her what was going on. I just wanted to get to Sarah, and to get to her fast. When I was running up the stairs, I got another chill down my back, and noticed that the temperature in the flat was the same as it was outside, freezing, despite the heater being on. I was even more scared now that I was at the door. I hesitated to open it for a split second, wondering what I would do once I was in there, but I needed to do something. When I slammed the door open, hoping to scare the man myself, my heart sank lower than my stomach. The man that I had seen in the window was gone without a trace. Sarah had begun to cry from me barging in, and my mom had run up after me. I knew she wouldn't believe what I had seen, but I told her anyway. She called the cops, but they said that there was no sign of forced entry or of anyone being there at all besides us. My mom called Sarah's parents right after and they came to pick her up immediately. We never really heard from them after this, and I try my best to keep it tucked away in the back of my mind. I still don't really know what to believe, but what I do know is that I saw that tall, skinny man looking at Sarah that night and reaching into her crib, and that it was the scariest night of my life. I'd like to share with you some unexplained experiences that have been, and still are, taking place in our rented property in England. A bit of background first. The house is a small, one-bedroom, pre-World War I terrace house, 
originally built to house steel workers around the time of the Industrial Revolution. So yes, the house is old, very cold, and has an unfurnished basement, which floods when the water table rises. It also has a very leaky attic, neither of which we use. Myself and my wife have lived here for the last five years with our small dog, and there have been some very strange goings on. In the years we've lived here, we've been subject to some very strange things which we haven't been able to explain. And here are a few, starting with the earliest. Number one. About a year after we'd moved in, my wife, myself, and the dog were sat in the living room around half past midnight one evening. I was watching TV, the dog was asleep next to me, and my wife was watching something on her tablet at the other side of me. Our kitchen and living room are linked by a solid folding door, which was closed. From the kitchen, I heard one of the dog toys begin to squeak, as if someone had stepped on it and then taken their foot off. Obviously, this was quite alarming, as I assumed there was no one else in the house. Startled, I jumped up, as did the dog, and approached the door to see what was happening. As I approached the folding door, it moved slightly, as if someone had pushed it from the other side. I jumped back and let out a yell, before shouting to ask anyone that was there to please leave. I initially assumed that someone had entered the kitchen through the back door. Terrified, I went into the kitchen to find it in darkness, the back door locked, and the dog's toys piled up in the corner as they normally are. Still scared but with adrenaline rushing through me, I quickly ran upstairs to see if anybody had somehow gained entrance to the house through the attic or a window. Thankfully, no one had. Nevertheless, this meant that I could not easily explain what had just happened. Number two. The second event happened about six to eight months later. My wife and I were in bed, again with the dog at the side of us, when we heard what sounded like a large crash coming from downstairs. In the intervening period between the first event and this one, we had been broken into. So obviously, as you could expect, I was wary of immediately running downstairs in case it was another intruder. Eventually, I managed to bring myself to work my way downstairs. The house was in darkness, nothing was out of place in the kitchen. However, when I went into the living room, the sofa cushions and TV remotes were scattered across the floor. All the doors and windows were locked. And again, there was no obvious sign of who or what had caused this. Number three. The third major event took place at around 3 a.m. All of us were asleep in the bedroom when I was awoken by the sound of footsteps walking across the landing and downstairs. Startled again, but not really thinking, I jumped up, woke my wife up, turned on the bedroom lights and landing lights, and ran into the landing itself and downstairs very quickly. The house again was in total darkness and all the doors and windows were locked. Nobody was around. The dog had followed me this time and was growling quite a bit. But again, I could not explain what had just happened. There have been some similar, smaller events that have taken place since and are still taking place. We've had crashing noises from the kitchen when we've been in the living room, footsteps in the bedroom when we've been downstairs, and laughing and giggling noises from various areas of the house. Recently, in a new development, we've also found items that have been missing from their normal places, sometimes days later without explanation, and returned home to find that lights have been turned on and things have been moved around. The dog often stares into corners of the kitchen, bedroom, and at the top of the stairs for a few minutes with no explanation. My wife and I are both rational people, so we have looked at obvious explanations for the events. Clearly, it sounds like we've got another person living in our house, but we've not yet been able to successfully explain them. 
We have CCTV installed in the kitchen. We've checked it at various specific times during some of the events above, and we've seen nothing. We've asked our neighbors if they've seen anything unusual taking place while we're asleep or not in, to which they said they hadn't. I wouldn't necessarily say that I believe in poltergeists or ghosts, but I am a firm believer that there are often events and things that we cannot explain using modern science and Occam's razor. I'm interested to know what anyone else thinks we are experiencing. I'm telling this story on behalf of my girlfriend. We'll call her Amy. She's 21 years old now and was around seven at the time of the encounter. This story has been pieced together from what she can remember, what her brother remembers, and what her mother and father can recall from the incident. She lived in a relatively recently constructed house in a very quiet area in West Yorkshire, England. Think Emmerdale, located beside a graveyard. Cliché, I know. Being that it was in a rural area and a new house, it was very quiet at night, and any words spoken in any room could be heard at the other side of the house. When her dad was redoing their garden, he unearthed a multitude of very old, dusty objects, including old bottles and pieces of stone slab that really couldn't be anything other than pieces of old graves, leading the family to believe that their house was built on top of an older part of the graveyard that had sunken into the ground after many years unattended to. One night, just after the school holidays had ended, her brother, Alex, remembers being sat in the lounge doing his homework. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw his little sister Amy holding a book out to him, apparently trying to be helpful. He told her that she should be in bed, given that it was past her bedtime, and focused back on his books. Their mother, from upstairs, no doubt having heard what he had said to Amy, shouted down, Amy's already in bed. Alex, then from his books, looked up completely, and realized that the girl standing in front of him was a complete stranger with red hair instead of Amy's brown hair. Given the extremely late hour and what he describes as an intense and immediate feeling of unease, he screamed, which caused the stranger to dart toward the stairs away from him. Alex followed immediately and upon reaching the stairs, he bumped into his mother, who had come running down at the sound of his yelling. In a state of panic, he began shouting at his mother about a girl who he had just seen run past her on the stairs. His mother saw nothing, led him back to the lounge, and tried to calm him down. Later that night, having calmed himself down and gone upstairs to his bed, he was heading toward the toilet at the end of the upstairs hall when he saw the red-headed stranger again in Amy's room, sat on the end of her bed, just watching her sleep. Overwhelmed with the same feeling of unease, he rigidly returned to his room, and upon waking in the morning, convinced himself that it had only been a dream brought on by the strange events from earlier that night. Months later, the family was sitting in the lounge, discussing what Alex had seen that night, a subject that up until this point had been relatively avoided. Alex and their father both randomly blurted out at the same time that they had a feeling the girl's name was Alice. Neither of them could shake that extreme coincidence, and decided that they would search the large graveyard for any headstones with the name Alice. I'd love to be able to tell you that they found a single child-sized grave with the name Alice spookily engraved into the headstone, that they discovered that she had red hair and knew the exact circumstance of her death, but the reality is that there were numerous graves with the name Alice in that graveyard. In fact, so many that they can't even remember the exact number. Whether or not the name Alice was stuck in their subconscious having explored the graveyard at a previous date is up for discussion. 
but we still believe it was too much of a coincidence for them to be filled with that same feeling of intense confidence in her name at the exact moment. The family, having long moved away from that house, maintains that there were multiple strange occurrences in the household since Alex's encounter during his homework that night, and that out of the corner of his eye, Alex would still see a red-haired girl in the corners of Amy's room. I was studying abroad in the UK a little over a year ago. It was spring break and I traveled to Scotland with one of my buddies from school. We spent some time in Edinburgh and took a ghost tour, because why not? The city is ancient and awesome. I'm mad at myself for not having the setting on my phone's camera that records a few seconds before each picture turned on, because I would have caught a wisp of white like a thin silk handkerchief being tugged out of frame the second before the picture was taken. That was at the tomb of Mackenzie in Greyfriars Cemetery. After Edinburgh, we went up to North Inverness. We explored the town a bit, but my eyes and mind were drawn to an odd-looking hill a little ways outside the downtown area. It seemed so out of place, just plopped into the middle of a neighborhood in the city, far away from any of the surrounding mountains. My friend looked it up and discovered that it's called Tom Nehurich Cemetery Hill. Tom Nehurich means Hill of Yew Trees or Hill of Fairies. The base of the hill is surrounded by a large cemetery with some gravestones that are really old. We made our way to the top of the hill and began meandering through the gravestones up there. Some were really interestingly designed but we noticed that the earliest ones at the top of the hill were much younger than the ones at the bottom. My friend is a camera nut and wasn't walking as fast as me, so he fell behind taking pictures of some crows that were cawing loudly in the surrounding trees. I was just walking slowly along the path when I heard a woman whisper my name in my left ear. The day was slightly rainy and no one was in the cemetery besides my friend and I. At first I thought he was trying to be funny, but when I turned around, he was over a hundred feet behind me, and obviously he doesn't sound like a woman. I didn't say anything right away, as I was kind of in disbelief and awe, and an eerie feeling of being watched slowly came over me. On our way down the hill, the feeling of being watched faded, and I mentioned what I heard to my friend. He is extremely skeptical. When we were at Mackenzie's tomb, the tour guide brought us to another, smaller crypt around the corner and told us that people get attacked in it. My friend went in and stood in the middle, defiantly. He just doesn't believe. But after I told him about the whisper, he mentioned that he had thought he heard what sounded like footsteps on the fallen leaves behind him for most of the time we were up there, but didn't want to say anything. Right then, a bunch of crows started to caw loudly at the top of the hill above us and all took flight, as though something had startled them. We got out of there right quick and made our way to the pub. A few days after what I have called my fairy incident, I was back in my student apartment in England. Now, I had never experienced sleep paralysis before. There was an incident where it felt like my whole body was asleep like when your hand or foot falls asleep, but I could still move. It was just uncomfortable. So I don't really know if this was sleep paralysis, but I was rationalizing why I shouldn't move. I didn't want it to be surprised and hurt me, but let me back up a bit. I awoke. I knew my eyes were closed, but I could see the room perfectly. And I knew that it was the middle of the night but somehow, there was a silhouette of a figure in the window at the foot of my bed, illuminated from behind by a bright light. I realized that I was awkwardly twisted, like my legs and pelvis were down on the bed, but my head and shoulders were up toward the ceiling and my hands were resting overlapped on my hip. The figure didn't give off any feeling to me, 
I was completely indifferent about it, just watching it. It stepped around the right side of my bed, which is a wall, the only part of our room out of place, and sat down next to me. Even without the light behind it, it was still a silhouette. Not really a shadow, it had depth. It placed one hand on my overlapped hands and put the other on the right side of my head, then leaned in really close to my left ear. At that moment, my brain was like, this is not normal. This shouldn't be happening, make it go away. But I didn't want to move and have it hurt me. So I started to breathe in and out loudly and quickly through my teeth, and the figure rapidly backed up, got up, and continued backing away. That's when I opened my eyes, and I was startled at how close my face was to the wall. I was still in the same twisted position. After writing myself, I turned on all the lights and didn't sleep for two nights. After the fact, I realized that I can't remember feeling it touch my hands, but I just knew that I couldn't move them or it would get startled and might hurt me. A couple of months after that scary night, I was back home in the USA. Once again, it was the middle of the night and I woke up, but this time I couldn't move. More like how I've heard sleep paralysis described. There was a dark figure standing over me. The best way I can describe it is like a ring wraith from Lord of the Rings, but without the armor. Like a stereotypical ghost, a black bedsheet draped over a person. After a few moments of, oh gosh, there's someone in my room standing above me, my left arm suddenly, like automatically, shot up and flipped on the lamp above my head. This wasn't a conscious movement. It was as though my arm was acting on its own. The figure vanished as soon as the light turned on. I haven't had any noticeable paranormal experiences since that figure, which part of me attributes as something to do with the fairy that followed me from Scotland to England. I don't feel, and never have felt, in danger from the Fae, other than when the fairy was right up against my ear. I don't really know what to make of it, if I'm marked or what have you. Just some interesting things that happened to me that I believe are different than ghosts. I was hunting in a fairly large forest somewhere in the northeast corridor of the United States. It's not uncommon to run into other people at the edges of the woods. It's fairly uncommon to run into people in the middle of the woods, even during hunting season, unless you're on the trails, which I wasn't. And it's decently common to run into the ruins of buildings from the 1800s. I happened to be hunting a new valley, and I was pretty sure it had a crossing into it to set the view. So I'm sitting on top of a very steep shale slide, looking down into a valley with a creek running through it. Approaching this plateau, there's a knife edge that runs up and down the ridge. But there's really no way to get up to this spot, except for the seriously determined, the drunk, and the foolish, without walking up or down the edge. Getting up here creates quite a noise from the stones sliding on the other stones, which means I know I need to sit up here for an hour to let things settle back down after I make my ascent. It's such a pain in the butt. I left my day pack at the bottom under a pine tree and only had a rifle, binoculars, water, and an energy bar. I'm up here for about three hours, glassing this little tiny stream, looking for something to cross it, and seeing nothing but squirrels and birds, I finally decide to start looking at the opposite hill out of sheer boredom. I'm 90% sure I chose a poor spot and wasted an afternoon looking at nothing, such as hunting. It's got really interesting days, and it's got really boring days, and this is why it's called hunting and not shooting. As I'm screwing around with the focus on the binoculars, I catch a glimpse of something which almost looks like a person if they were wearing dark blue clothes and about four feet tall. 99% of the time, day hikers just pass by without realizing I'm even here, even with the blaze orange requirements, or they pretend to ignore me. 
You'd be amazed how many times someone has almost walked through my stand. Anyway, this person wasn't moving, which started to make me think that I was wrong about it being a person. It was just standing there, behind the cover of some low scrub brush and tree branches, and I would have missed it had it not been for its color. I zoom out a bit and realize that I'm not looking at a person, but a collapsed cabin, and I was looking at where the door would be. Except, it really looked like a person, and cabins aren't blue. I moved the zoom back onto the door and played with the focus for about five minutes, and I just can't get this person to come back into focus. In fact, the cabin door now has some light from the setting sun visible through the holes in the walls and the roof. Whatever four-foot-tall thing I was looking at has moved. Sigh. Teenagers, right? I have that thought. And then I realize something. I can still hear birds and squirrels and all the other things in the woods which would typically go quiet when they notice something. Which means that they didn't notice me. But that also means they didn't notice whatever was in this cabin door a short time ago. I'm doing my best to stay quiet and not move, and whatever it was certainly did move. I would expect everything in the woods to have gone for cover with a teenager crashing through the brush, but the noises almost made it worse. There was stuff moving in the brush. The problem was, stuff was moving around in the brush. I started to think that this was a trick of the light since the sun was setting, and it was getting to the part of the day when tree stumps looked like deer. I knew that I would have to move soon and figured I might as well pack it up since I still had to get down off the shale and back to the pine tree where I had planned to throw a tarp and sleep. At this time I realized it wasn't dark per se, but it was overcast now. Again, the creepy experience isn't that there's something obviously wrong. It's that everything is so completely normal for what I would expect were I alone. About this time, a fog rolled into the valley, which the combination of overcast weather conditions, sunset, and a ground fog coming up in the west low valley had signaled it was time to leave. I checked my safety, put the caps on my glass, and reached up to take down my orange flag. The moment I grabbed the flag, the dread came. That's the only way I can describe it. The woods went from animals going home to sleep to full-on, you're screwed. The movement had attracted what I could only describe as a thousand invisible eyes, which all turned in unison as they noticed me. Ever wonder what a deer feels like in the headlights? This is it. Then, I heard children. I heard children laughing. Not teenagers, not adults, not women but full-on five-year-old kids laughing like they caught a firefly. I had hiked in five miles the previous day through the woods and put down two more today when I woke up to get to this spot, and I distinctively hear children laughing during what I could only describe as the creepiest moment I've ever had in a valley that I know is completely unoccupied having stared at it for the last four hours. I'm pretty sure my feet only touched the shale three times getting down from that knife edge, and I made a ton of noise doing it too, but at this point I didn't really care. I grabbed the pack and my flashlight, and I absolutely full-on rucked it to the next hilltop. I killed my light halfway up the hill, and then went to the top of the hill where I threw down the tarp, unrolled my foam, and sat there all night watching the hill I had just come from. I still have no idea what I experienced. Some people tell me that I had a run-in with the Fae. Either way, it was definitely the most unsettling experience I've ever had. My mom's friend Lucy had a massive house with a garden backing into some woods. At the time of this story, I must have been around 8 or 9, and my two older twin brothers were 11 or 12. I remember them being too old to play with me, and they often left me out of their games. My mom and Lucy were in the kitchen making lunch. I was in the garden sun, playing with a doll innocently, sitting on the floor trying to occupy myself. 
when something made me look into the tree line of the woods. There stood a small girl. She was around my size and waved me over to her. You can imagine how happy I was upon seeing a new potential playmate. I walked over and she led me through the woods and into a clearing. In the clearing, it looked like some sort of party or celebration was going on. I saw a few girls and boys my height sitting down on some chairs, a makeshift table in the middle, and heard faint music coming from somewhere. This sounds crazy, I know, but it sort of resembled the Mad Hatter's Tea Party from Alice in Wonderland. They all looked pleased to see me and made me sit down. The little girl had a plate with a slice of cake on it and was edging it toward me. I knew that I would get in trouble with my mom for eating before lunch and not waiting, so I shook my head and held onto my doll. The girl frowned and placed the cake back on the table. She asked me a few more times after that to eat it and each time I declined. It felt like I was there for only a few minutes and I suddenly became worried that I was going to be in trouble for missing lunch. I told them that I needed to go home, but that I would come see them straight after I've eaten. I made my way back through the woods. The sun kept coming through the trees as I ran past them. But stepping out of the woods, I could clearly see that it wasn't sunny anymore, let alone daytime. The sky had turned dark and a feeling of dread and confusion came over me. I walked to the house and through the door only to be greeted by my mom's high-pitched scream as she ran toward me. She gave me a massive hug and then proceeded to yell at me. I found out that I had been missing for seven hours. Lucy, my brothers, and some neighbors were all out looking for me. I tried my best to explain to my mom that I had been playing with my new friends for a few minutes, but she thought I was lying and wasn't having any of it. It still confuses me to this day. I've seen something that I've come to know as a red cap or a blood cap. It's supposedly a kind of pagan fairy or spirit or demon. When I first saw it, I thought it was a person, and then when I realized something was off about it, I thought it was a ghost. I'll tell you about it first and then explain how I came to know more. I first started seeing it relatively recently, during the summer of 2016 friend of mine had been renting a house from his parents. It was a partially completed extravagant brick house at the back end of a clearing and field in the woods, with a completed portion being attached to a trailer house. Myself and several other friends of ours accumulated a group totaling about 10 regulars. We were enjoying our summer vacation from university and working, and when we had time off we were all chilling at his place watching movies, smoking, working out, drinking, etc. We'd thrown several huge blowout parties over the spring and early summer months, with over 300 people showing up to them each as well. At one of these parties, a huge brawl had broken out over some drunken disagreement, fueled by the reality that rivaling town's students were at the party, and some rednecks who had shown up from Kellyville had fired off some guns. In the panic after the gunshots, one guy ran over the water line with his vehicle and broke it pretty badly, so we had to bring water jugs and make do as a group until the water got repaired, which took a while because college kids are broke. So we'd have to go outside to the woods to relieve ourselves. While I was out there, I saw it. It would be dressed differently from time to time, but it was always one of two outfits. It would either be dressed in dirty overalls, either with bare feet or with boots, with a dirty shirt underneath, and it would either be bald or wearing a straw hat. Or, it would be in a very old black tuxedo, with a really bad black toupee on. It looked like a white man with a huge nose and large eyes. It would be standing in the field, staring at the house, and if you looked away and then looked back again, it would be standing in a different place in the field, still staring at the house, and standing just a little bit closer to the house as well. 
Never at you, though. It never felt strange or weird, though. It was like being at someone's house and seeing a person who lives there on the property. It was like it just belonged. And it always showed itself sometime in between sunset and sunrise, during the twilight hours or late at night. I didn't mention seeing it at first. It was actually a girl who hung out with the group that came inside and asked me about the man in the field. At that point, I got excited because somebody else had seen it too. I asked if it was wearing what I just described, at which point the friend who owned the house yelled, Yes, you've both seen it too? Over the next couple of months, seven more people saw it without any of us telling them about it first. And yes, to be fair, we were usually slightly high on marijuana or drunk when we would see him, but those don't usually cause hallucinations like that, especially shared ones. They could lower our inhibitions enough to see something paranormal, though. Over these same months, people at the house would say that they felt like they were being watched from corners and doorways, and several things would move around the house when nobody was there, like a set of praying hands above the fireplace mantle being found on the kitchen stove with the palms facing away from you. Multiple people remembered things that didn't happen, like shelves that are bolted into the wall falling down, and the cabinets in the kitchen would open on their own. There was also a Walmart bag filled with other Walmart bags hanging on a hook that was moved aggressively like somebody had slapped it, when several of us were in the kitchen to see it, but nobody was near enough to touch it. Anyway, when we finally got fed up with what terrible landlords his parents were, he decided to move out, and I said that I would help. Now, keep in mind that this night we were 100% sober. We were gathering his stuff to help get him moved into a different place, and had almost everything gathered except this lotto ticket that he'd won a little bit of money on. Again, college kids, anything helps. So the two of us were up there alone, tearing the house apart looking for this lotto ticket. It had just been on the bar counter, and it had disappeared. During the search, I looked in a nearby room, and as soon as I walked in, I saw it, standing right outside the window, looking into the house. I didn't move. I didn't blink. I didn't take my eyes off of it. After a moment, I called for my friend to come in. I just pointed at the window when he walked in, and he saw it too. We kept our eyes on it while talking over how to react, and decided to just find this ticket and leave, since this being had never been aggressive and we were going to be coming back anyway. We went back into the main area and continued our search, eventually getting tired of looking. I stopped and leaned over the bar while looking at my phone, when I got a really weird feeling coming from the doorway of his parents' old bedroom, across the living room. As I turned, my friend walked into the room, and stopped, and looked into that room simultaneously. We both felt it. Standing in the room, behind the TV and the TV stand, was this thing, a couple of feet taller than it looked before dressed in that tuxedo and toupee. Its large eyes were jet black and looking right at us, and for the first time it didn't feel like it was okay, or that it belonged. It felt aggressive. After a few moments of us staring back at it in silence, my friend ran over and shut the door, and then said we were leaving. I had already turned around to grab a bag, and in the hallway, right behind me on the floor, was the lotto ticket we'd been searching all over the house for. I grabbed it, and on the way out, I looked up at the fireplace mantle, and the praying hands had been turned, with their palms facing out toward us. We haven't been back to that house since. A few months later, we were hanging out at our dealer's house. He's an old-school hippie, and he's deep into pagan beliefs. We were talking about ghost stories over a bowl of weed with him, and another guy who hung out there regularly also practiced the same beliefs. After describing it to them, they looked at each other and both told us that it was a blood cap. They told us that it was a demon of the Fey realm that claims land and then drains the energy off of it. That they get their names from the practice of dyeing the twigs and toupees that they wear with human blood and that ours was probably a young one if its hair was black. 
Then the dealer, sensing our skepticism, told us to hold on a minute. He left the room, and then he brought back a book full of descriptions and artistic renderings of spirits, laos, demons, fairies, and monsters from pagan beliefs. He showed us an artistic rendering that looked exactly like what we had seen, right down to the big nose and the huge eyes. Definitely one of the most interesting and creepiest experiences of my life. I know that I'm about to sound like a head case. I do have anxiety, depression, ADHD, and PTSD, but this isn't something that I can pin on any of those. I have two past experiences about the Fae, at least I think that's what it is, and I'm going to repeat them here to see if anybody knows what they might be. The first experience was a little man that I would see in my girlfriend's basement. Little trinkets would go missing and would be moved down there, and we found a pair of eyes drawn into a spilled pile of glitter after we respectfully asked that if there was anybody living in the basement, they move along and leave our things alone. I moved from New Jersey to Georgia shortly afterward and briefly had things move around, but nothing went missing. I also thought that I may have seen him in my new room, but I can't be too sure. The second experience was that I would hear pacing outside my bedroom window. My crystals were being knocked down and moved without explanation. I also hear something call my name from outside the window just before sunrise, but when I try to say to leave me alone, I am unable to speak. Now, this is the part that I actually need help with. Three things have gone completely missing since I started seeing this little man. I can't be sure if he's related to the things happening outside my window and my moving crystals, but I think it's a reasonable assumption. Three of my most treasured belongings have disappeared seemingly from the face of the earth. The first is a meteorite that I found on the ground during one of the worst days of my life. I carried it with me every day after that, and always felt at least marginally better when it was with me. Then I lost it and my mental health went completely to crap. This happened before I moved. My girlfriend and I searched her house over and over and we were never able to find it. I know the last time I had it was in her house because the last time I remember having it I was horribly sick and she handed it to me to help me calm down a little. I didn't leave her house for three days and I couldn't find the meteorite the day after she handed it to me. The second is a flannel hoodie my sister gave me for Christmas. I wore it all last summer. It's very light material and the sleeves roll up easily. I wore it while walking through the woods a lot. It had nice big pockets that I would use to carry my crystals around in. One day it just vanished. I checked every room in the house and every vehicle my family owns. Gone. Finally, I have a black baseball hat that I embroidered myself with an anatomical heart. I've worn it almost every single day for nearly four years. I feel like I look naked without it and I'm always careful of where I put it. I cannot find it. The last time I wore it, it was last night. I rode with my mom to get food and we used a drive through so I never left the car. We've torn apart both the house and the car and come up with nothing. All three of these items were special things that I had with me almost every day that I was very careful to remember where I put them. All three have vanished without a trace. The strangest part is that my memory feels completely wiped when I try to think back to putting them down. I don't remember ever doing it. Am I just losing it? Are the Fae really taking my things, and if so, is there anything I can do to get them back? At least just the hat? Also, carbon monoxide isn't a possibility. We have a monitor thing with working batteries, and we've checked all that out. I just want my stuff back. Or at the very least, I really want to know what's going on. Unlike what's perceived in the West, 
We here in the East have a completely different opinion about fairies. Our legends also speak quite differently than what's portrayed in Hollywood movies. One such belief is that if a person sees a fairy, which is an extremely beautiful and pure making of God, the person is bound to have good luck. But if the fairy catches them watching her, the person is doomed or killed on the spot. I'm staying with my grandparents during Christmas right now. My grandfather is a businessman who deals with silk. This requires him to travel to the city quite often to make his sales, and quite often he gets late. Usually, nobody waits up for him as he has dinner before he returns home and he has a spare key. Last night, as usual, we went to sleep at around 10 p.m. Grandpa wasn't home yet. We didn't realize that he had forgotten his spare key. It was raining like crazy and apparently he came home at around 2 a.m. Everybody was asleep and he knocked, but as the rain was pounding, nobody heard his knocking. He waited for a while and lit a cigarette and just looked up at the sky when he saw something he'd never seen before. In the obviously dark sky, there seemed to be huge white figures with wings just soaring. There were around four or five of them, and there was some kind of smoke around them, but he could make out a human form with wings. This obviously freaked him out and he banged at the door harder. This woke me up. I realized it was him and I opened the door. He was wet and looked pretty weird. I was too sleepy to ask him anything about it, and I just went back to sleep. This morning, he told us this story, and he's hell-bent on the fact that it's fairies. He told us that his father had seen similar creatures, and that they were fairies, and he'd seen the same exact thing. He won't accept any other explanation, and he has a counter-explanation to everything we say, even though I think some of our suggestions make more sense. But what do I know? Maybe Grandpa's right, and it was the fairies. Our family has had paranormal experiences in the past, but this is the first of its kind. Do I believe in fairies? If you had asked me just over a year or so ago, I would have laughed and said no. I am a recent believer in the Fey now, though. Fey more or less being a filler term for invisible trickster beings, at least for me. Less than a year ago, after talking about the possibility of some kind of interdimensional, invisible beings with friends, a lot of weird things began to happen in my room. Keys went missing for hours on end. Items were moved around and I heard weird noises at night. I asked whatever was hanging out to leave me alone, and everything stopped. The start of this month, I was talking about it again with my friend. I joked about inviting whatever was screwing with me back because I was getting bored. Without telling anyone else, I formally did just that, and I even left a little offering of candy on my nightstand. The next day, I came home to my locked room, took off my shoes, and found myself stepping in sand. There was sand all over my nightstand where I had left the candy, all over the floor, and all over the bed. For a few days after the sand incident, my lamp turned on by itself a few times, and I watched a bag move on its own. I couldn't tell you what they look like, or if they really are what we would traditionally call fairies, but something is there. And from my experience, they come around when you talk about them a lot. I grew up in an old, old house in the south, kind of in the middle of nowhere. The house was laid out somewhat circular, as you could walk from the living room through most of the other rooms just by walking in a complete circle and ending up back where you started. When I was around five, my younger sister and I were chasing each other in circles while my mom cooked dinner. I was in front of her and we were laughing and carrying on. 
When we got into the dining room, in the inside corner, there was a small greenish creature with a dark cloak on. It had pointy ears that stuck out and sharp teeth. I was young, but it was still very small, so I'd say maybe two feet tall. It looked kind of like it had been at the bottom of a pond or something, very old and tattered. It put its finger to its lips and was grinning. I slammed to a stop and my sister was chasing so close that she ran right into me, which pushed us both around the corner and into the kitchen. We both started screaming and my mom ran to us to see what was the matter, but the thing was gone. This has haunted me for years, I'm 25 now, and although I've done tons of searching, I've never really found anything that fits what we saw. For the longest time, I thought maybe I'd imagined it. And if it weren't for my sister also seeing it, or my mom remembering our very real terror, I probably would have just written it off. Any ideas as to what this could be? There were a lot of weird things that happened in that house when I was young. Disembodied voices, things moving, super weird dreams. But that was obviously the weirdest and most unsettling. Any feedback would really be appreciated. We still talk about it from time to time, and to this day, it always makes us feel kind of yucky. Also, just to clarify, this thing didn't look like a little man or a gnome or anything like that. It was more akin to a gremlin type with no hair that I could see and green skin. Anyway, let me know if you know what this is. I was very interested in astronomy and logic as a child. Right around five years old, my first tooth began to wobble. I did not believe in fairies at this time, yet I was very invested into stories and books about them. Many adults would have fun telling me that a tooth fairy would visit me soon, to which I assured them that that was nonsense. Well, one winter night, I was in Sydney, Australia, my brother and I slept in the same bed because we only had one room with the heater and it wasn't the one we were in. I looked at the sky and I saw a golden light moving with a motion that was very large, kind of like a whale in water, almost as if it was wishing to go faster but was lagging. It was soft, elegant, and on a very specific, accurate path. The movement was very natural, like a slow hummingbird. The light moved mostly straight from left to right with the occasional twirl. As I looked longer, I saw a small human form and wings. It was hard to tell how far it was from me, but it didn't look as though it was more than 30 meters away. It also had this trail of sparkles following it. Yes, just like Tinkerbell. I called my mother to go see the fairy, to which she said, Dear, if I go look, the fairy will fly away, because I am an adult. It's obvious to me now that she was just playing along. To this day, she thinks it's a joke, and it's odd that if she merely went, she would have seen it, and possibly it would have altered her entire life. After I came back into the room, it was in the sky a little longer, but then it was out of sight. Maybe it was a fairy. Maybe it was an angel. My brother saw it too, as it turns out, and we've brought this up to each other a few times over the course of our lives. He remembered without me having to say anything else other than, remember the light? I still wish my mother had seen it, but to this day, it's one of the most interesting experiences I've ever had, tooth fairy or not. When I was a sophomore in high school, my mother had been diagnosed with a spinal tumor. They were able to remove it, granted she became confined to a wheelchair. For the year after that, she was in and out of different hospitals doing rehab and trying to recover. 
I remember the first night I ever stayed the night with her by myself. My mom had been in a fairly stable condition, so my dad decided to let me stay. He took my sister to the mall, and while they were shopping, she saw a pocket fairy keychain from Zoomies that she just had to have. It had a bunch of signals on the packaging, and even a little story about how they captured the fairy in the woods and turned it into a keychain. She was instantly obsessed with it and was carrying it everywhere with her. Well, my dad ended up losing his wallet, and his battery was dead by the time they got to the parking lot. He chalked it up to a string of bad luck. That night, I was sleeping in my mom's room at the hospital. At around 3 a.m., she suddenly woke up coughing profusely and couldn't breathe. The doctors and nurses rushed in, and they had to give her an emergency tracheotomy. A tracheotomy, if you're not familiar, is when they have to put a tube down your trachea to help you breathe, or to essentially breathe for you. Definitely one of the scariest parts of my life. Now, when I told my dad about it, he said that that happened around the same time that he'd gotten up to use the restroom, and he swears that he heard some sort of demonic, distorted version of my sister's voice saying, Do you want to keep playing with me? When he stepped out, he saw the keychain in the hallway, even though he saw my sister go to sleep with it. He had no idea how it had gotten there, but once he saw it, he immediately ran to his truck, drove to the river by our neighborhood, and launched it out as soon as he could. Almost instantly, the nurses told me my mom was fine, my dad found his wallet, and everything went back to normal. Not sure what to make of this, but I thought I would share my story. This story happened when I was about two or three years old. While my mother was pregnant with my half-brother, I was in a small but cute room. There was some wallpaper that had fish and stars with faces and stuff like that, and I would always stare at the cartoon moon because it intrigued me. For a few minutes, at most 15, I would stare at it, and I would understand somehow that I was safe if the moon was watching me and that evil, tricky creatures would never hurt me if the moon was watching. Now, for quite some time, I've had this abnormal feeling that I've met something magical. I always had this inside feeling that I could have been in a magical place or seen something magical, and I don't know why. But recently, I remembered what it was, and here is the story. One night, I'm staring at the cartoon moon, when I hear a knock at the window. I turn to see a small woman with wings. She was very pretty, and she was wearing pure gold clothes. Obviously, as a toddler, I couldn't do much, but this fairy, I guess, would begin to dance around and entertain me for a bit. Every night, she would come to the window and dance around and generally entertain me. You get the gist. Sometimes I remember her telling me stories, however, I can't remember which ones. But I still get the feeling that she did. Every time, somehow, she would give me a sense of Christmas cheer, even in the summer. I remember thinking about sugar plums and other Christmassy things, and then she would say goodnight and fly away. As I grew up, it became less frequent, and at some point she never came back. However, I would always remember the experience each time something about fairies or magic would come up. It's like a nostalgic feeling, and I never knew why that feeling occurred until today, when I remembered this specifically. I have personally had some experiences with nature spirits in my hometown in Europe and also overseas in Thailand and southern China. I had these experiences mostly in places that didn't have a lot of people, which makes me wonder if it's because these entities don't like crowded places, 
or if it's just difficult to sense them when there are other living beings around with their energy and vibrations. Here in Europe, I'd often hear or feel something following me when I would go for walks in forests or rivers, either behind me or in the trees right next to me. When I first started noticing it, I thought it was birds or something, and sometimes it is, but other times it definitely isn't. I mean, there's no way a bird or any other critter is walking behind me and making that much noise. Once when I was in Thailand and walking around at night in an area with abandoned and wrecked houses and a small temple, it was clear that somebody was following me. It didn't sound exactly like a person. The steps were really light and a bit faster than ours. It just started out of nowhere. It was just trees and wrecked abandoned houses. My friend was with me, and she knew the place and told me that it was completely normal since the area had some intense spiritual activity. She's kind of a medium. I'm quite familiar with the unseen too, but she has control over her ability and she's extremely sensitive to these things. At some point it just stopped, just as it had started, suddenly, as if something just appeared somewhere behind us, followed us for a bit, and then disappeared. Something similar happened when we were walking along a water channel during sunset. It was mostly forest all around, and there were lots of blooming trees. It was quite dark, and we couldn't really make out each other's facial traits anymore. At some point, it looked and felt as if other entities were walking around us. It was something magical. This last one may sound a bit less interesting, since it could be considered just a coincidence, but I'm including it anyway. There are legends about dragonflies, about how they can travel between worlds, and that red dragonflies are ancestors coming back from the afterlife to visit their living relatives. I have some Chinese ancestors pretty far in my family tree. When I was in China, there would be one red dragonfly flying around for just a few seconds every time I came out of work. To this day, I still like to think that it was one of my ancestors looking over me, as cheesy as that might sound. Anyway, those are my experiences with Fae or nature spirits or whatever else you'd like to call them. In November of 2016, my family takes me to Disneyland. We stay at an Airbnb, the whole deal. We go back to Disneyland the same day, at 11 o'clock at night, trying to make the most of our money. I walk through the gates, and everything goes silent. I hear the stuffed animals that people walk past me with, saying, Help me, they're going to kill me. As soon as I walk through, clear as day, I saw and felt a world of genocide. People on the floor, middle of the day, crows picking at their bodies, everybody on the balconies, without eyes. I thought that I was the only one left on Earth. Thirty seconds later, it was over. I never saw it again, and I never told my family. If anyone has any experiences or answers, please tell me. I've worked for the Disneyland Hotel for over a year. I work in one of the many departments that would need to deliver things from our department to the guest rooms whenever a guest needed them. One night at around 11.30 p.m., I was making a delivery when I heard a group of children laughing from the pool deck, which is surrounded by a gate. Since I was headed to a guest room and they had been given a wait time so they knew when to expect me, I didn't stop to see who was playing in the pool and to check that they were at least being monitored by an adult. After delivering what the guest needed to the room, I headed back to where I was supposed to be waiting when I heard more children laughing from the pool deck, as well as some splashing. 
Since the pool water itself is well lit and the pool deck is poorly lit, I expected to at least be able to see some kids playing in the pool and something resembling an adult within easy hearing range. By the time I had walked up to the gate, which is covered in plants, the laughing and splashing had stopped and I could see that there was no one anywhere near the pool or the pool deck. It really makes me wonder what I heard. While I know that there have been deaths at the hotel and in its rooms, most recent deaths happening weeks before this posting, all of the deaths have been adults, making me wonder why I was so sure of what I was hearing. I've also been deaf in my left ear since childhood, so any sounds that I did hear would have had to have been very, very loud. I'm still not sure how to explain that experience. When I was nine, my parents bought a derelict farm abandoned deep in the woods of Sweden. This isn't the first time my parents have done this. My parents had just sold the first farm after they made the farm livable. I was sad to part with it, but I looked forward to a whole new world of adventure and discoveries in the new farm. Nothing spooky ever really happened on the first farm. I was never afraid of the old house or the woods around it. I could be alone for hours in the woods, just playing and making dens for the picnics with my imaginary adventure team. Something changed, though, when we bought that second farm. The first couple of times we came to paint and build on the house, nothing happened. I was just exploring the different buildings and the woods around us. This farm had four buildings, the main house, the garage, a stable, and we never really found out what the fourth building was. It was badly damaged after it had burned down before we got there. I was really into horses and I used all of my time in the stable. We had owned the house for a year when something happened. I was in the stable playing with some hay when I suddenly felt like somebody had their hands around my neck and then they squeezed. I couldn't breathe. I instantly ran out of the stable and as soon as I saw my mom, I could breathe again, but I was coughing and wheezing and I couldn't stop. I was trying to explain what happened, but my throat hurt so much that I just kept coughing. My mom rushed me inside the house and got some water. I was still coughing and gasping after 15 minutes, so my mom decided to drive me to the hospital while my dad stayed with my brothers. I eventually stopped coughing, of course, and nobody could ever really understand what had happened. Up until I was 14, I never had any allergies, and I had my first asthma attack when I was 13. The episode that I had was written off as an asthma attack, but looking back now and knowing what an actual asthma attack feels like, I call bullshit. After that whole thing, I stopped playing in the stable and opted for playing in the woods with my brothers. The next time something happened, I was 11. I had woken up in the middle of the night to hear somebody walking. I stood up from my bed and walked past my parents who were sleeping in the same room. I went to the kitchen and saw a black figure standing in the middle of the kitchen. Had I not noticed that I had walked past my dad to get there, I would have thought that it was him, but it wasn't. I was frozen, but something came over me, and I turned around and walked straight back to bed. I couldn't sleep though. I felt prickly eyes staring at me the whole night. I told my parents the next day that I saw a man in the kitchen, but they told me that I was probably dreaming. I probably was dreaming. But after seeing that figure, I always felt like I wasn't welcome and that I felt eyes on me all the time. One occurrence, though, left me terrified of the house and I begged my parents to leave me with my grandparents whenever they went to the farm. One day, I was on my computer chatting with some online friends and playing a game. 
My parents wanted to go grocery shopping and asked if I wanted to come too. I declined, being really into my game, and they asked me if I was sure. I nodded and they left with my brothers. I immediately regretted not going as soon as the door slammed shut. A feeling of terror came over me. I was scanning the whole room I was in, scared to find something that I shouldn't have. The car had already pulled onto the dirt road and out of sight by now. The sound of the car drifted away and I was left in terror and silence. A silence that somehow grew louder and louder until it was deafening. I felt a pop in my ears. I was shaking and my teeth were chattering. And then I heard a tap, then another, and another. The taps were in a predictable rhythm. I knew it would be at least two hours until my family came home since the grocery store was miles away. I had to endure it, but something sent me running out of the house. In the doorway to the kitchen, I saw a figure walking toward me. This time, I knew that this was no dream. My lungs felt like they were being crushed, and I began getting a headache. I stared at the figure for a good five seconds, and then, in pure shock, I sprinted out the back door and toward the dirt road. I was thankful that I was still wearing my flip-flops after eating breakfast outside. I ran up the dirt road, aiming to get help from the neighbors who lived a 20-minute walk away. I didn't expect to see our car coming down the road. I walked to the side of the road and my parents hopped out and asked what happened. I burst out crying so they put me in the car and I refused to go inside the house again. My parents thought that I made it all up and they told me that I was paranoid. I stand by what I saw. It's years later and I still hate that farm. I've only visited once since then but never again. Whatever was on that farm hated me, me specifically. But there's one other thing about that instance that bothers me. How long was I frozen in place? Like I said, it felt like only a few seconds, but it takes hours for us to go grocery shopping. And my parents didn't come back early. They had the groceries. I felt like what happened was maybe in a span of five to 10 minutes, but I had to have been sitting there for hours. Honestly, I don't even want to know. I'm just happy that I don't ever have to go back there again. This takes place on our farm at night when I was 11 to 12. I farm, I always have, and I always will. But if you farm after dark, stuff gets scary. I've been farming since I was little, and I never really was afraid of the dark or any of those strange noises. But what happened that night still scares me to this day. I was probably 12 when this happened, and I'm 16 now. I was just getting done in one of our fields and was putting the tractor into the shed. It was probably around 9 o'clock by then, so it was pretty dark. I backed the tractor into the shed and shut it off. I got out of the tractor and shut the door. I walked down to the end of the shed to grab my phone charger and grabbed it. When I did, I heard a click and then a squeak of the tractor door opening. The hairs on my neck stood up because I knew that nobody was in this shed with me. There were no lights in the shed, only the light of the pole light outside. I pulled out my phone for light and at the time I had a flip phone but it was still bright enough to see a dark figure sitting in the tractor. I booked it out of that shed as fast as I could. To this day, I don't know what that dark figure was and I'm still spooked about it. I really don't like farming alone at night anymore. This is a story that I've carried with me for the last 24 years. 
I haven't really spoken much about it since I was a child. You're free to not believe me. In fact, I encourage you to doubt anything that you're told from anybody. I'm writing this because as I've gotten older and I've spent over two decades developing a life to the best of my ability, I've carried an immense weight on my shoulders that nothing seems to alleviate. So I thought maybe telling my story would help. I am not from here, and by here, I don't mean where I currently live. I don't mean where any of us live. Anyone who is hearing this right now, it's now a few days after my 30th birthday, and this time of year always strikes me, because I started kindergarten on my birthday when I turned five. I thought, at the time, that everyone did that. You turned five, and when you turned five, you went to school. I didn't realize that my birthday just happened to coincide with the first day of school. A little over one year later, in about two weeks' time, it will have been 24 years to the day that my entire world vanished. I was born in San Diego, and I lived in a poorer suburb of San Diego as a child. I lived in an apartment complex called Lemon Vine Apartments. They were a bit slummier versions of the Lemon Vine Apartments found in Lemon Grove, which is a suburb of San Diego. My parents were divorced but friendly. My mother was young when she had me, and she was beautiful. She was in her early 20s and was aspiring to be a model. She would regularly take trips to LA to do photo shoots. She did glamour modeling for magazines. She had a darker skin tone, being one quarter Indian, and it gave her an exotic look. My favorite picture of her as a child was her modeling a luxurious wedding dress for a bridal company. I used to sleep with that picture when she would go to LA and I would stay with my dad who worked for the city of San Diego. They shared custody pretty evenly and we even did Christmas together as a family even though they had split when I was still a baby. My dad, his girlfriend, my mom who was single, and me. Maybe things weren't as good between them as I remember, but I was six. So if there was drama behind the scenes, they did a really good job of hiding it from me. On September 17th, 1996, I was staying with my dad's parents in Riverside, California. They had a small farm where they raised chickens, pigs, and goats. No horses or sheep or anything. But my grandma had several pet ducks that would eat from your hands, fly away, and return every year like clockwork. My dad had to work at night for a week and my mom was in LA, so I stayed with my grandparents. Schools back then were pretty cool with this kind of thing, and I was sent home with the sorts of nonsense assignments that you would expect of a first grader who had just gone back to school after summer break ended. The 17th was the third day that I was staying with my grandparents, and my grandpa had told me to be careful outside because he'd seen a rattlesnake and wasn't sure where it had gone. So, since nobody knew where the mystery snake had gone off to, six-year-old me decided to go hunting for it. In hindsight, letting a six-year-old go looking around a farm for a rattlesnake was probably not in any Parenting 101 handbook, but this was the 90s and I guess they didn't actually expect me to find it. There were woods on the property, but I wasn't allowed to go in there so they probably figured that's where the snake had gone off to. I spent all day outside playing jungle exploration on the farm, trying to track down this snake. And, much to my excitement, when I decided to open the well house, there it was. Curled up, rattling away. I immediately slammed the door shut and ran to my grandparents' house to tell them that I'd found it. Now, this might be my six-year-old memory exaggerating, but I'm pretty sure that snake was like 900 feet long, give or take. I found it though. I was excited to tell my grandpa that I had found it so he could do what he did, go out and shoot the thing. I ran in the back door of the house, which leads you into the laundry room and through the kitchen. I paid no mind to anything until I turned left and entered the living room expecting to see my grandparents, my uncle, and the neighbor couple all sat in the living room where I'd left them. Except they weren't there, and it wasn't the same living room anymore. The furniture was completely wrong. 
the hard and memorably uncomfortable hardwood furniture my grandpa loved so much was gone. The coffee table that he had made out of a tree stump was gone, replaced by fluffy grandma-looking furniture. A three-person sofa with a floral design on it. The TV was in the wrong place, newer than my grandpa's old sit-on-the-ground cabinet television. The hardwood paneling on the walls was gone, or at least covered by blue wallpaper. The hardwood floor was a shaggy off-white carpet. The pictures of my dad, my uncle, me, and my grandparents were gone from the walls, replaced by paintings and pictures of people I didn't know. As confused as I was by all of this, I was more confused by the fact that everybody was missing. In my six-year-old brain, I accepted that they may have completely rearranged the entire house while I'd spent the day looking for a snake, but I didn't believe at all that they would just leave me alone. I didn't see anybody leave. I didn't see the cars go down the road. So I walked out the front door, which was attached to the living room, as they usually are, and I thought that maybe they had gone to the chickens or the pigs. Both should have been clearly visible from the front porch, but the chicken coop was gone, and the pig pen had lost its fencing. There were no pigs to be found. At this point, I was beyond confused, and I was getting very scared. I didn't want to be alone, and I didn't see anybody. Even though they lived on a small farm, the neighbors that had been visiting lived just across the dirt road. So I ran down our dirt driveway and across the road to their house, assuming that must be where everybody had gone. I remember getting more and more scared as I ran to their house, and I remember starting to cry when their house was the wrong color. It wasn't the faded yellow house it used to be. It wasn't even the right house anymore, but nevertheless I banged on the door. I remember that at this point I was crying quite profusely because I didn't understand what was happening, and I kept wiping my face, which covered it in dirt after having been digging around under stumps and logs for snakes all day. When the door opened and a woman in her late 40s or early 50s answered, and I'd never seen her before, I just started bawling uncontrollably. Everything after this point is largely a blur because nothing was right. I knew where I lived. I knew where I went to school. I knew where my grandparents lived. But I met the people who lived where my grandparents lived and they were not my grandparents. I didn't know them. I begged for them to get my uncle to tell them who I was, but my uncle wasn't there. Through a series of various police and people in suits, I was brought back to the town that I lived in after what seemed like 10 hours in the local police station trying to contact my parents. I had my home number memorized, but told them that my dad would be asleep. But when they called that number, the person on the other end had no idea who I was or what they were talking about. I was asked to give the police officers my address, and I sat in the local police station while the police in my hometown went there. When they finally called the station back, they were informed that the name of the apartment building was incorrect. Lemon Vine Apartments didn't exist, and the address that I gave them was to an apartment complex called Merritt Manor. The apartment number that I had given them was unoccupied. I believe at this point they were operating under the assumption that I had given them the wrong name of the apartments and the wrong apartment number, but I did in fact live there. When I was finally brought to my hometown after changing hands a couple of times between police, I was asked to give the police officers my address again and was driven to where I live. That was it. That was my apartment complex, but just like everything else, it looked wrong. It was painted a different color, and the sign that used to have a large image of a lemon reading Lemon Vine now read Merritt Manor. I took the police to exactly where I lived, and just as they had said, no one lived there. From this point forward, the police attempted to contact neighbors, all of whom knew me, but none of them were who they were supposed to be. Every person who came out of the apartment building was the wrong person and none of them knew who I was. 
From this point, they attempted to contact my father, which should have been easy. He worked for the city, but no employee by his name apparently worked there in any capacity. A day turned to night, and I spent endless hours sitting in the police station as they attempted to find any person in the world who knew me. I couldn't do anything but cry and cry endlessly. A woman in a suit, who I think was either a detective or just somebody who happened to work there, sat with me for several hours and tried to keep me calm. She gave me a stuffed dog, a Dalmatian puppy, that looked a little bit like one of the dogs from 101 Dalmatians. She told me that his name was Sparky, and that I could keep Sparky, and that when they found my parents, Sparky would go home with me and make sure that I never got lost again. She said he was a good dog and he would protect me if I took care of him. During this time, they attempted to contact my school. I told them I went to Shawnee Elementary. It was easy to find. It was really close to where I lived, but a school by such a name, as you might have guessed by now, didn't exist. My school was apparently called Anza Elementary. At one point, I was asked if the police had ever taken my fingerprints, and they had. In my kindergarten, my entire class had our fingerprints taken by the police at the school gym for basically exactly this reason. Unsurprisingly by now, this didn't help at all. They couldn't find my parents, my grandparents, my neighbors, my apartment, even me. They couldn't even find me. I was too young to remember what my social security number was, but I severely doubt that it would have mattered. They asked my birthday and any relevant information that could help them figure out who I was and where I belonged, but nothing that I told them turned up any information. At some point during the day, I was briefly taken to the ER as the police suspected I may have sustained some kind of head injury. After being looked over by a doctor, of course, they found nothing wrong with me and I was sent back to the police station. I ended up staying with somebody that night, but I'm not entirely sure who it was someone from child services, I imagine. I couldn't stop crying long enough to really focus on what was happening after this point. I had cried myself to sleep several times in the police station, and I cried myself asleep again at the house I stayed at that night. Despite the woman that I was staying with doing everything in her power to calm me, this was not the same woman who gave me Sparky. I clung to Sparky so hard I'm surprised I never popped his head off. I didn't have my picture of my mom, I didn't know what was going on, and nobody could find out where I belonged. This didn't make any sense to me. I was only six, and just barely. I lived where I lived, and my parents were my parents, and my school was my school, but they all just disappeared one day. But they couldn't have, right? In between fits of crying and waking up, I begged to go home. I begged for the lady I was staying with to try and call my dad again. I just kept begging to go back. Over the next few days, I was interrogated and questioned by different people at different times, at different places, at all hours of the day. Police, investigators, people from departments I still don't know the names of, child psychologists, everyone under the sun was asking me questions. I was back and forth between the police station and the house I was staying at, until eventually somebody told me that they thought they had located my parents and that they were coming to get me. Finally, I was going home. Finally, this was all going to be over. Finally, I could get away from these strange people asking me the same questions over and over. When the couple showed up at the police station though, my heart fell into my feet as these were not my parents, but they'd had a son that went missing and I fit his description pretty closely. The woman started crying when she saw me, though, because she immediately knew that I wasn't her missing son. I was out of tears to cry at this point. Eventually, I was collected by child services, and I was taken to a foster family where I stayed for a few months. The police launched a campaign, asking for anybody to come forward with information about me. They took my picture at the police station for the newspapers to put on the news. I never let go of Sparky, not even for a second. They didn't want me to hold him in the photo, because I didn't have him when I arrived, but I needed him, and I would throw an intense tantrum whenever somebody tried to take him away. 
They had me put back on the clothes I was wearing when they found me, but they had since given me new clothes to wear. In those months I spent at the foster home, parents of missing children would come to the house to see if I was theirs. I didn't realize that this is what was happening until I was older and looked back on it. They didn't just pull me out and say, is this your kid? They were a little bit more subtle about it. The parents would come to meet me, and upon realizing that I was not their missing child, they would often leave in tears. Looking back at all these families that came to see me in desperation that they were going to have their child back, I feel so horrible for them. It's a feeling I can't really explain. Almost like a type of guilt. Almost like I wish I had been their child so they could have them back and know they were safe. Most of those people probably never saw their children again, but I try and imagine that all of them were reunited, even though I know that isn't likely. This guilt was one of the things that kept me in therapy as an adult, but like I said, no therapist has ever bought my story or believed what I've said. The most common belief suggested to me has always been that I was abandoned as a child, I lived in an abusive home, I was dumped on the side of a dirt road in the middle of a farmland, and I repressed all the negative memories I had of my past. I didn't stay in that foster home permanently. Eventually, while my case wasn't officially closed, I needed to start going to school and I needed identification. I was issued a birth certificate for the date that I told them was my birth year, but the day and month were listed as September 17th, the day that I was found. I never understood why they didn't just use the day and month of my actual birth, but I imagine it was because they didn't actually think that I knew. My name was unchanged. I started going to school sporadically. One of the child psychologists who had seen me recommended that I not be placed back in full curriculum immediately and suspected that I suffered from some form of PTSD. I was put in the special class and was made to go to school twice a week initially. Eventually I started going to school full time and changed foster homes a few more times. I really can't say how much time passed before it happened, but eventually I was placed for adoption. I was never actually told that I was up for adoption, so I'm not sure how soon after found it was. But eventually people started coming to meet me, again. But these people weren't looking for a missing child, they were looking to adopt one. I definitely did not represent myself as a good candidate. I had a story that nobody believed and could verify. I insisted my parents would eventually find me, and I rarely had a day that I wasn't crying until my eyes burned. This story, sad to say, doesn't have a happy ending. I never saw my parents again, and I was a ward of the state until I was 18, and I went nowhere from there. My teens were filled with delinquency, and I did a brief stint in something similar to juvie that San Diego calls chaparral. I never went to college, and I never really started getting my life together until I was about 24. I've never publicly talked about this before, at least not since I was a child speaking to everybody who was trying to figure out where I came from. I still have Sparky. He's old and worn, still in one piece, but no longer white. He's now a dark shade of gray. He sits on my dresser and is there, just like he always has been, as long as I've been here wherever here is. And this happened to me about 10 years ago, but it still sticks with me to this day. I was around 15 years old and my mom and dad decided that we would take a trip to my aunt and uncle's new house that they had just bought in Gridley, Illinois, and stay for a few days. We lived in central Indiana, so it was about a three and a half hour drive to get there. The house was an old farmhouse, probably built in the early to mid 1900s, and sat very isolated, basically in the middle of a cornfield. I have a very large family, and a few more of my mom's siblings traveled to the house as well, so they were going to have a big party. My uncle, who owns the house, has a son who's about a year or two younger than me. We'll call him Steve. So my cousin Steve and I had been hanging out all night, 
playing video games, spending time with our families, and so on. Everyone was up fairly late, and as people started to go to bed, the party was dying down, and Steve and I decided to go to his room and crash for the night. Steve has a pretty small bedroom. I would say it's about 10 feet by 10 feet, but he did have bunk beds, so there was plenty of room for both of us to sleep in there. He normally slept on the bottom bunk, so I climbed up top to lay down for the night. As I did basically every night, I would pull out my phone and check MySpace or Facebook, whatever I was using at the time. I can't remember if MySpace was dead by then. So after laying there for about five minutes, Steve gets out of bed and said that he needed to use the restroom. The head of the bed is right next to the door. So I look down and I watch him leave the room and shut the door behind him. His room was basically pitch black dark, but there was some light from the hallway, so I clearly saw him leave. At this point, I'm laying on the top bunk in his room by myself in basically pitch darkness besides a light from my cell phone. He was gone for maybe a minute, when all of a sudden, the bunk bed starts slamming into the wall behind me, like there was somebody at the foot of the bed rocking the bunk back into the wall. As it's slamming into the wall, my first thought was that maybe one of Steve's older brothers was playing a prank or something. So I said, cut it out, that's not funny. The bed continues to slam into the wall. It did probably 10 times in total, about once every second or two. I waited for it to stop and I hopped down off the bunk to turn on the lights, expecting someone to be standing at the end of the bed laughing at me. I turned the lights on, but nothing. Nobody was in the room, just me. Like I said, it's a very small room and I made sure to check everywhere. Under the bed, in the closet, I was the only person there. At this point, I was completely terrified and I was trying to rationalize what had just happened. I decided maybe the bed is just rickety and somehow I was rocking it. I got to the foot of the bed and I tried to recreate what had happened. Not happening. This bed is one of those all-metal bunk beds bolted together, and it's not going anywhere. The only way to get that bed to move the way that it did would be to slide the entire bed back into the wall, slide it back, and repeat this motion. This thing was on carpet too, so it wasn't moving. I tried with all of my strength to mimic what I had felt, and I couldn't do it. At this point, I'm in total panic mode. I run out of the room, down the hallway to the bathroom, and I ask my cousin what the hell he was doing. He told me that he was going to the bathroom. I asked him if he was just in the room messing with me, and he asked me what I was talking about. I explained what happened, and once he was out of the bathroom, we went back to his room and talked about it. He said that he and his family have almost all had experiences of some kind in that house, paranormal in nature, since they moved in. Safe to say that night, I did not sleep in his room. I went and slept on the floor next to the bed where my parents were sleeping. This is the only time in my life that I have ever experienced anything paranormal, and that'll do for me. This happened when my boyfriend and I went to Florida, specifically Miami, for our winter break. This was literally right before the pandemic hit America. Most news was still about China, so we were still allowed to travel. We were having dinner at this barbecue place that we found while we were driving around. We couldn't decide what to eat, so we just agreed to stop at the next place we drove past. Neither of us can even recall the name of the place, and the food was meh. Anyway, we were finishing up, and the waitress comes and passes us the bill. Like, okay, that's normal. The thing is, both my boyfriend and I was so sure that he had picked up the bill, slid his credit card there, and left it on the table. Like, it happened so naturally. It was such a routine thing to do, we weren't paying attention, but I could have sworn that I saw him take the check. So then comes a random waiter who didn't serve us at all that night and picks up the bill. 
Then the original waitress who had served us comes back two minutes later and tells us we forgot the card. Inside the book thing that they give back to you, there was nothing. When my boyfriend checked his wallet, the card was gone. We were so dumbfounded. The next 10 minutes, my boyfriend and the staff were searching for this card, which was nowhere to be found. And mind you, our table was like less than 10 feet away. Anyone would have noticed a card dropping on the floor. The waiters and waitresses swore that it was empty from the second they picked up this checkbook thing. Even if they wanted to steal it, why would they take that risk? It makes no sense. And my boyfriend even waited a day to see if there was any activity on his card, but there was nothing. He cancelled it later. What's weird is that we also couldn't remember who the waitress or waiter was that was involved with the bill, even right after it happened. The whole thing was just so weird. And honestly, we never even saw that second waiter again. I'm not sure if it was a glitch or what, but it was just strange. It was senior year of college, and my best friend and I were driving south to meet a friend in Florida. We were on a small back road, about 40 minutes or so out of one small town and about 40 minutes away from the next. Suddenly, out of nowhere, there's this deep fog. I had to turn on the windshield wipers to continue to see the road. I looked down briefly to adjust the wipers, and when I looked up, out of nowhere, there was a man standing halfway into the road. He was unlike anything or anyone I have ever seen. White skin, white hair, white clothing, and no shoes. He had his arm out signaling for a ride, and he didn't flinch when our vehicle went by. Worst of all, he had these glowing white eyes. Now, I've seen plenty of animal eyes glow, dogs, cats, you name it. But I've never seen a pair of human eyes reflect the light like that. It was unnerving. Anyway, I swerved out of the way, laid on the gas, and kept going. My friend and I were both quiet for a moment, and then she turns to me and says, Did you see him too? And I said, Yes. She paused and asked, and the eyes, I'm not crazy. They were glowing, right? I assured her that I saw the same thing. We haven't spoken about it since. To this day, I think about the man with the glowing eyes. Where did he come from? What did he want? And worst of all, what would have happened if we had actually stopped or crashed while swerving to avoid hitting him? All my life, my mom has always unwillingly been a magnet for paranormal activity. She never spoke of it. She thought of it as a curse that plagued her. Once at around two in the morning, I found her sitting at the dining room table sitting stock still, smoking cigarette after cigarette, staring into the living room with all the lights off. The cigarette smoke was settling at about the halfway point in the room so it looked like a low, stagnant cloud, adding to the suddenly alarming feeling of the space. I called out to her, but she didn't respond. She just sat there, the ember of the Marlboro brightening with every drag. You could hear the crisp sound of the burning tobacco as she inhaled. I just stood there, arms crossed, chilled from the night air, looking at her in confusion. M Mom? Mom, are you okay? She just sat there, silent, stoic, staring at nothing. Another drag. And then, finally, she said something. They just walk through. They, they just walk through here. I don't know where they're going. I scanned the room, 
goosebumps shivering up my arms. Who, Mom? Who walks through? Nothing. I was young and fairly creeped out, so I just backed up slowly and quietly went back to bed, closing and locking my bedroom door. The next morning, I asked her what that was all about, and she acted like it was nothing. Like I'd had some bad dream and thought it was real. She completely played it off like I was the crazy one to think that she would ever do something like that. And then she said, you know I quit smoking six months ago. Stuff like that happened all the time. These little incidents that she was part of but would never acknowledge after they happened. I know she had some gift or power or something, but she never actually told me about it. I think because she hoped whatever it was wouldn't find an attachment to her sons. It did anyway. It was my first year back from college. I was asleep in my bed, briefs only, the morning sunlight streaming into my room and waking me from my dreams. It was warm and bright. I can still feel the way the sun felt on my skin that morning as I lay on my stomach, blankets thrown asunder by the vigorous sleeper that I was. The day was going to be beautiful, and I was thinking about what I'd do first after breakfast. I was facing the wall opposite the doorway of my room, staring at the cocoon movie poster that I loved so much, when I heard my bedroom door creak open. Mom checking on me before she headed to work. Only, suddenly, something felt off. I could hear the door opening. I knew the sound of that door as well as I knew every creak and groan of the house that I'd grown up in. I knew what it sounded like when it was opened all the way, but it didn't open all the way. It stopped suddenly. It was like the minute that I recognized something was off, the door just stopped moving. Like lightning, a wave of terror rushed through my body, washing through me like an icy wave. I was fully awake instantly and paralyzed with fear. Completely paralyzed. It wasn't my mom. I knew it. Whatever it was, it was not my mom. I couldn't move. I couldn't yell. I just lay there, completely terrified. Then it started moving toward me. I could hear the steps on the carpet. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it would burst. I was so scared, the tears started streaming from my eyes. I could feel it stop, hovering over me, looking down. I kept praying that it wouldn't touch me. Please don't touch me. I could feel it reaching out, its arms extending, moving to rest a hand on the small of my back. I managed to close my eyes and decided that I was not going to let this happen. I was going to count to three and gather all of my strength and jump up and scream. I was going to break this paralysis. As I made this decision, I felt the arm stop. It stopped right over my body. I felt the presence freeze. So I gathered all my energy and I tried to count to three and move, but I was still so scared that nothing happened. I barely moved an inch. I closed my eyes again and focused harder than I ever have on anything in my life and managed to roll myself off the bed and squeak out a meager yelp. It was enough though. I hit the ground hard breathing heavily and sweating from either fear or the suddenly hot sunlight streaming through my window. My bedroom door was closed. There was nothing around me. The presence was gone. I threw open the door and ran up the stairs to the living room where my mom was getting ready to go to work. You're up. I was just about to go down there and say good morning. Bright, cheery, like nothing had happened. You weren't just in my room, checking on me or something? I said, wiping sweat from my forehead, completely confused. She gave me an odd look. No, and for God's sake, put some clothes on. I'll see you tonight. After that, she was gone. That was the first time. But since then, it's followed me everywhere I go. I don't feel it all the time. Sometimes years go by, but it always comes back. I don't know if I will ever find out what it is. 
My mom passed two years ago. With her gone, I can only hope that she tries to protect me from whatever this is. This isn't the only experience I've had either. It's just the one that profoundly affected me. At first I thought it was a sleep issue, but the problem is, I was awake the whole time. I remember seeing the wall, the poster, the bright room, feeling the sheets beneath me, the smell of the fabric softener. I'm no fool. The first thought I had was that it was a dream. But I was going through the logic of what was happening to me, and I knew that it wasn't. That, coupled with our family's history, my mom's experiences, my experiences, I knew something was happening. We traveled everywhere, all over the world and the country. I think we picked up something, somewhere, and I think my mom knew it. This wasn't the first thing that happened, it was just the biggest. One day, I'll tell you about our house on Park Place in Florida. That is where I began to think that my mom had secrets she didn't want to share. But I guess some secrets I'll never know. I was in Florida for a high school marching band trip. This was about three to four years ago. We were to march in the Disney parade as the marching band, so we got to spend time in Florida and we went to all the theme parks, including Universal. One day when we were in Clearwater, this event occurred. Three guys who were a part of my group and I were chilling on the beach, far away from most other people. All of a sudden, I heard a really dark, deep voice say, It wasn't like a yell, so it didn't make me look around or anything. In fact, it almost felt more like a thought in my mind, but it was very clear and distinct. I was kind of shook for a second, but I didn't really want to mention anything to the guys I was with. After about a minute, one of them asked, Did you guys hear that? Instantly, I asked, the no? Everybody had heard that exact same no with a deep male voice. It sounded very close, as I said, basically like a thought. And again, the nearest people were easily 60 feet away, and it was a mom and her kids. As a sound engineer, I can confidently say that a man with a deep voice couldn't say a soft no loud enough from over a hundred feet away to make it feel like it was inside our very heads, especially with all the chatter from everybody else on the beach and the sounds of the ocean muffling it. That's it though, nothing else happened, so I mean, it's not a super interesting story, but I 100% believe that there's something out there now. I just don't know what it is. I've worked in multiple prisons. Due to privacy reasons, I won't name them. I wasn't at this particular prison for very long, and due to the notoriety of this specific inmate, it will give away that prison's location, but that's fine. I worked in the prison that holds Florida's death row at one point in my career, before transferring to a prison that was a lot closer to home. Due to the fact that I am a woman, they really didn't want me on the row unless it was for training. I was training, and during my training I was given a tour of the row and the death chamber. Our death chamber is comprised of two rooms. One holds our gurney for lethal injection, and one holds our electric chair. I wasn't technically working on the row. But we did have an inmate who was on death watch, and there needed to be an officer in there 24-7. Death watch is where the inmate is moved to the final holding cell until the execution, where they receive their last meal and everything like that. An officer came to relieve me for a 15 minute break, and due to the size of this prison, I couldn't walk out and have a cigarette in time, 
I decided to explore a little bit on my break out of morbid curiosity. I walked into the room with the gurney and saw it from the window and felt my heart sink knowing that the inmate that I was watching over would be strapped down to it in just a few hours. He ended up getting a stay of execution, however, so that never ended up happening. I ended up finding myself in the room with the chair, and when I did, something felt really off. I felt a mix of feelings, despair, anxiety. My mind was racing. I felt uneasy, and I turned to leave the room when I heard, you didn't think I would be back, huh? I felt like I was in an arctic tundra. I began to shiver. My spine was tingling. I was frozen in fear because I knew that I had entered that chamber alone. I forced myself to turn around. I had my pepper spray in my hand just in case I ran into an inmate that had somehow escaped from the row. I did run into an inmate, but definitely not the one that I was expecting to. I was staring dead into the face of Ted Bundy, sitting in the chair that he died in. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. My heart was racing and I felt like fainting. I began to back away slowly. It was like he was alive. He wasn't see-through. It was like he was really there. The only way that I would have ever known this was an apparition was because that I knew that he'd been executed in the 80s. But still frozen in fear, I watched what appeared to be an alive and solid Ted Bundy disappear like he'd never been there in the first place. I got the hell out of there and was pretty much unable to speak to anybody for the rest of the day. When my husband and I lived in Florida, we bought a cute little three-bedroom, two-bath, ranch-style home as our first home. It wasn't huge, but it suited us just fine. We built a huge organic garden that took up about a fourth of the backyard. There was no indication of any presence in the house, at first. Over time, however, I started to notice little things that slowly turned into bigger things that I couldn't ignore. There were two smaller bedrooms on one side of the house, and those were our son's rooms. The front room was our younger son's room, and the back room was our older son's room. He was about three when we bought the house. That back bedroom always had a strange feeling about it, I wrote it off as me just being weird when we initially moved in. I distinctly remember having the thought that I was glad I didn't have to sleep in there, and that my son was so young that maybe he wouldn't be bothered by it. Wrong. When our son was about four, he asked me if God wakes us up in the morning. I told him, not physically, but metaphorically, yes. Of course, I explained this in four-year-old terms. He said that he wanted to know if God actually wakes us up in the morning. I said, what do you mean by wakes us up? My four-year-old son said that somebody tickles his feet in the morning to wake him up. What? It was tough, but I tried not to react in front of him. I told him God doesn't usually do that, and I moved on. Thankfully, he didn't ask about it again. There were a lot of nights before my third son was born when my oldest would come into our room saying that he was scared and couldn't sleep in his room. He would sometimes sneak into our room and use his pillow and blanket to sleep on the floor beside our bed without waking us. Generally speaking, he never really did like his room. There was even a time, out of a need for sleep, that I told him to sleep in our bed and I would try to sleep in his bed. I actually couldn't do it. It felt like somebody else was in the room with me the whole time and I couldn't fall asleep. After that, I was much more lenient about him sleeping in our room. He was very relieved when we had our third son and made that room the nursery. We put bunk beds in the front bedroom and put the two older boys in there. 
Now that the back bedroom was the nursery, that meant that I had to go in there several times throughout the night to nurse my infant son. I was not thrilled with that idea, but having my other sons in the front bedroom immediately put a stop to my son waking us up in the night because he was afraid. That was helpful since the new baby was already keeping me up with feedings. The feeling of never being alone and always feeling watched prevailed. It never seemed to affect the baby though. He slept a typical infant schedule. However, I dreaded his nightly feedings. As soon as I stepped out of my bedroom, I felt that someone else was there. Once I entered the nursery, the air actually felt heavy. It was as if the atmosphere in that room was thicker. I couldn't really distinguish it. It felt like dark energy. It just felt different from the rest of the house. There were nights when I would constantly look around the room, half expecting to see someone looking back at me. The feeling of being watched was so tangible that it often gave me goosebumps. Then, it all came to a head during a typical feeding one night. My baby was probably about four months old or so and woke up at about 3 a.m. Pretty normal for him. As I sleepily stepped out of my bedroom, I saw a black figure in the shape of a man sitting on my couch. The features were definitely the build of a man, but perfectly jet black. I couldn't see any defining features like eyes or a mouth or hair, just the outline of a man that was solid black. As soon as I saw him, he stood up from the couch and disappeared. It was so fast. I stood in the doorway of my bedroom, trying to figure out if I'd really seen what I saw. I can still see it in my mind's eye to this day. It was definitely up there with some of the coolest paranormal experiences I've ever had. Of course, my immediate problem was that I had to walk right past my couch and into the nursery to nurse my son. I'm sure I don't have to tell you how much I didn't want to do that in that moment. But he was crying, and I suddenly wasn't sure if he wanted to be fed or if something had woken him up and messed with him. I rushed in to find him doing this typical hungry cry. He was such a cute little baby boy. He's almost 11 now. I miss those days. Anyway, I got sidetracked. I scooped him up and nursed him, all the while looking around the room and listening intently for anything that didn't sound normal. I felt creeped out and didn't feel alone, but we got through the feeding without further incident. The feelings of being watched and never feeling alone continued until he was sleeping through the night. Thankfully, he never seemed affected by it and stayed in that room until we moved when he was three and a half years old. My feeling of unease while in that room remained throughout the entire decade that we lived there. The second time I saw a shadow figure in that house happened about two and a half years after the first time. It was the middle of the night and I guess my husband couldn't sleep. He'd gotten out of bed and gone to the living room to read. I woke and opened my eyes to see a male figure standing on the other side of my bedroom, facing me. He was mostly black, but I could see that he was wearing cloth pants, kind of like khakis, and a short-sleeved, checkered-type shirt. My grandfather had just passed away a couple of months before this, so at first I thought it was him, because those are the typical types of clothes that he would wear. I mean, who knows, maybe it was. He has visited my dreams since then. I looked down to where my husband should have been laying and put my hand there in order to wake him to tell him to look, only to realize that he wasn't there. As soon as I looked back up, the figure turned toward the little door to our back porch, took one step, and disappeared into the door. The whole thing was over in just a moment. After a minute of coming to terms with what I'd just seen, I went quickly into the living room and told my husband what had happened, still convinced that it was my grandpa. He, of course, said that it was a dream and told me to go back to bed. I find it interesting that the figure showed up the one night that my husband was not in the room with me. I do not think that that was a coincidence. 
There have been other strange things that have happened in the home, too. We had a dog that would bark at our closet in our bedroom for no apparent reason. I don't mean she would bark in a friendly way, either. This was the danger, I don't recognize this person, bark and growl. I was actually kind of thankful when we moved, although the house was perfect in every other way. I still miss our huge organic garden. We went back there a couple of years later and met the family that bought the place. I casually asked how they liked it and if anything strange had ever happened there. Anyone who has ever seen a scary movie would have asked a million questions at that point. They simply said nothing ever had and moved on in the conversation. I left them with my email address, but I've never heard from them since. I assume they're doing fine and are comfortable in the home. As I've said before, these energies tend to find me. It's possible that whatever was there when we moved out, left. I didn't have any major experiences beyond a few whispers in our rental house before we bought the home we're in now. We've lived here for over three years and have started having some interesting things happen here now. I'm sure that means I'll have more stories to tell in the future. This was told to me by my friend who lives in Florida. One of the reasons I believe him is because I stayed at his house and observed what seemed to be paranormal activity. My friend is an artist, and before getting a studio, he would do his art in a very old warehouse. Keep in mind, he has OCD and is very specific with how he sets everything up. On more than one occasion, his work, mostly statues which weigh enough for it to take a large amount of time to carry, would end up on the complete opposite end of the table when he knows that's not where it was. There's also a room in there. It's said that a lady died in that room and the door to that room is never opened. He said that a few times he would walk by and the door was open and the light was turned on when he knows that it was definitely shut and off when he last looked. He said that all of these things happened at around 3 a.m. I know that that's kind of cliche, but I believe him. Maybe it's cliche because it's true. The incident that finally convinced him to get out of there was when he was packing up to leave one day. As soon as his last piece of art touched the trailer, the building made a sound as though the entire roof had collapsed. When he turned around, everything was fine. He never went back after that. I was working as a correctional officer in the state of Florida. I have a ton of stories, but I just want to tell one this time. I'll start with my first experience ever in the prison. It was my first week, probably my third day on the compound. We have to count inmates, so I was working a 16-hour shift. During the night shift, there's nothing to do. So we count the inmates who are locked in cells hourly. It was the 2 a.m. count and I was in a T-dorm. T-dorms, obviously by the name, are shaped like a T. There are two stories, and I was on the second story on the right side of the wing. The very first cell that I went up to, an older white inmate had his face against the glass. Inmates like to gun officers. I'll let you figure out what that means, but I wouldn't Google it. And I had been gunned quite a few times in the short amount of time that I had been there. Being gunned was something I didn't tolerate, so I told this inmate that he needed to be back in his bunk by the time I came back from counting the rest of the wing, or I'd make sure to throw the handcuffs on him. He didn't say anything. I wrote down the cell number and continued my count. It was the first cell on the wing, so I wouldn't have forgotten which cell it was anyway. I continued my count and went back to that cell to make sure that this inmate was back in his bunk. After shining my flashlight in the room, I counted two inmates, but these inmates were neither old nor white. I obviously freaked out, and I told the officer in the station once I got back. 
This officer told me that the guy's name is Kevin and he does this all the time. I explained that this guy was white and that neither of the guys in the cell were, so what gives? He said, oh, well, Kevin's dead. I actually found him after he smoked himself to death on K2 mixed with rat poison three months before you got here, actually. Prisons are not silent places, and I have a ton of stories, but that one was my first hell of an introduction. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13. He was two grade levels below me and was a bad boy while I was popular and in all honors college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and was teased that it would never happen. So in 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend or understand hiding the medications, thus leaving large amounts of methadone and other drugs lying around. This was before the opioid crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing our extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it, but I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman he waited for. I have woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I have angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no, and I believe him. We like to think that this is Josh playing practical jokes, something he was known for, but this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank, it saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to go wake up my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of my yard. All of a sudden, my boyfriend dreamed of this friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was literally dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying her father would navigate my loss to her and keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told them he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't, and I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. 
I had one bruise on my leg, and it was really tiny. That was it. Well, and the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex and spray paint. I just told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I'd never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown after the fact. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope that he's resting peacefully, but just periodically decides to pop in and check on us. I have never believed in the paranormal, and even to this day I'm not sure if I believe in the events of this story. It's been stuck in my mind for years, and I thought I would just share it. My father served in the Royal Military Police and left the army four years ago, after 30 years of service. My father has always been a very serious man, worked very hard, and the little humor he has is very dry. He has traveled the world with his work and experienced all manner of life. He is the last person to believe in the paranormal. Just over 10 years ago, he was on a posting in Germany, the last of the British troops before all the bases were closed. He had moved into a big old house. This house was where Hermann Göring, head of the Germany Luftwaffe, lived. My father lived there with three other high-ranking officers from different regiments, all of whom mostly kept to themselves. After four months, he happened to have a weekend alone in the house. In the evening, he was sat downstairs watching TV when he heard footsteps coming down the stairs and into the hallway. He thought nothing of it until the fourth time he heard somebody come down the stairs. He assumed one of his housemates had returned from leave early. He had gone to look, but there was nothing there. And after checking the rest of the house, he went to bed. The following two nights, the same thing happened but my father put the noise down to it just being an old house with creaky floors. Monday morning, he reported the noise, along with a draft in the bathroom and a leaky tap, to the site maintenance office. His housemates had returned and he had forgotten entirely about it. A couple of weeks later, he happened to mention the noises he had heard to the old German cleaner. She said in the most matter-of-fact way, that was Cedric. It turns out Cedric was a Polish prisoner of war who used to work in the house. Cedric was sadly beaten to death in the house, and it is believed that his spirit has remained in the house ever since. The cleaner told my father that Cedric walks the stairs every evening and makes occasional noises or gusts of wind during the day. My father told us occasionally about the noises and things that could have been Cedric, but none of us believed him. He learned the ways of Cedric, but there was never any flair or imagination to his stories. Just simply, there is a ghost that wanders around my house. Six months later, I went to Germany for a work experience placement near where my father was based. He picked me up from the airport and took me to the house where he lived. I stayed the night there, and there was no sign or mention of this so-called Cedric. In the morning, I was going for a shower when my father said, don't worry about the wind, it's just Cedric, but he means no harm. I thought he was winding me up, but I still put a towel under the door to avoid any drafts. I had just about finished my shower, about to go and tell my father that his made up ghost doesn't exist, when this breeze or gust of wind or something blew right through me. It was like nothing I had ever experienced or known before or since. It left me cold for the entire rest of the day. I grabbed my towel and raced out into the bedroom. I got changed, packed my bags, and walked out of that house. I believe it to be the only paranormal thing I have ever experienced. Thinking back, I cannot see how that could have been a draft or my father just winding me up. I don't know what it was, 
but I do know that there was definitely a presence in that house. So I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. So my mom was dating a guy who I wouldn't call redneck, but definitely not like a normal country guy. He also had a son who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically almost every Sunday we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not secluded like there were no other houses in the area but directly across the dirt road, there was an abandoned house that pretty much looked like what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. So my stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while for fun and would see some weird stuff, like a random chair in the middle of a room and a cooler full of dead roses. But one day we were headed in there like usual, but once I took a step in, I just wanted to throw up. My brother kept going and was telling me that it would be fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by and all of a sudden, my brother's face turns pale and he drops his water bottle and runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down and he says that we're never going in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12, but he was true to his word. We never went back. This experience occurred pretty recently, so my memory is very clear in regards to detail. This past year was my senior year of college, and I was thrilled to be living with an alumni of my sorority, with whom I'm very close. We'll call her Abby. Abby and I weren't actually supposed to live in the apartment we ended up in. We were originally going to be living in a townhouse with two other girls but they started so much drama a month before we were supposed to move in that we had to contact our landlord to find a different place within their company to live. Thankfully, we found a two bedroom, one bathroom basement apartment in a quiet area off campus. The first month was fine and without incident, but as the days went by, some strange things began to happen in the apartment. One morning, Abby woke up to a kitchen cabinet open she wasn't too concerned about that and figured that I had just forgotten to shut it the night before. The next morning, a different cabinet was open, and once again she shrugged it off. However, I went home one weekend, and she woke up to find every cabinet in the kitchen wide open and the sink running. Needless to say, Abby was scared and spent the night at her boyfriend's. Two weeks later, we were watching TV and heard the bathroom door close. I tried to calm Abby down by saying that the fan we kept in that bathroom probably blew it closed. However, when we went to bed, we thought we could hear someone walking around in our living room. There's no way someone broke into our apartment and hid the entire day, only to come out at night to screw with us. I was home the whole day, and Abby was home from 11 in the morning on. That incident took place shortly before Christmas break, and all was calm in the apartment, until February. Abby had gone home for the weekend, and I was home alone, relaxing on the couch and doing homework. It was pretty late at night, so I turned on the television for background noise and curled up on the couch to sleep. I woke up at 2.32 in the morning to see Abby walking through the front door, smiling but not saying anything. I blinked, still groggy from sleep and I asked her if she was okay. She just looked at me and proceeded to take off her shoes and walk into the kitchen. Something about her just didn't seem right. Like this girl looked like Abby and walked like her, but it also clearly wasn't her. I asked her again if she was okay 
because it was so early in the morning for her to be coming home. Abby looked at me, smiled, and began washing something in the sink. Something inside me felt a profound sense of dread, like I was in actual danger and I needed to get away, as fast as possible. I went to my room and locked my door. My roommate followed me, because I heard someone tapping their finger against the door. One, two, three, four, five times. It wouldn't stop. I didn't say another word, because it felt like if I did acknowledge her, it gave her more strength. I know that doesn't make a lot of logical sense, but that was my instinct. I curled up beneath my blankets and stared at my bedroom door, almost waiting for her to kick it in. My eyes felt heavy, and the incessant tapping was almost like a metronome enticing me to sleep. As I drifted back to sleep, the tap seemed to slow down to a trickle. The morning after, I was groggy and exhausted. It felt like I had taken 20 Advil PM, but I remembered everything that happened the night before. Cautiously, I left my room and saw that Abby's bed had not been disturbed or slept in. I went to the living room and her shoes and purse weren't there. A cold feeling crept into my spine as I sent her a text asking if she'd come home that night. She responded that no, she hadn't and wouldn't be for another two days. But I checked the sink and the bowl that Abby had been washing had been cleaned and put away. I firmly believe that I was not dreaming or hallucinating, and I know that this wasn't some elaborate prank by Abby because she would never do something like that. I firmly believe that something took the shape of Abby that night, and that its intentions were not good. There were a few other experiences in that apartment, but nothing so dramatic as what I went through that night. I'm sure it's not as scary as some other people's stories, but for me, in the moment, it definitely was.